will uh, call this meeting to order. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is a, an opportunity to um, bring names forward of uh, anyone we should be thinking about in a moment of silence. Anybody have a, have anybody? Jack? I guess Julie O'Malley, she's still recovering. Okay, for the record, uh, Jack Gaffey um, has um, mentioned Julie O'Malley. She had some back, oh, some back and issues. And back issues <coughs> and shoulder and... <laughs> <laughs> Julie's got some health issues that yeah. she's dealing with right now, and we hope to see her back we, soon. We she's wish her well. she's yeah. tending to them, and uh, we'll hopefully be back soon. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. Uh, if we can just bow our heads for a, a minute. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, Council, you were sent uh, copies of the minutes <coughs> earlier. <coughs> I didn't see any emails regarding any changes. Um, oh, scouts are here. <coughs> they usually tell me when they're coming. <laughs> I just have one spelling item on the bottom of the front page. It should be residents, not residents. <coughs> Matt, or Matt, do you see that? What paragraph at the bottom? It's right here at the residents. Here. Yeah. It should be. Just there. One's residents, not residents. Okay. <coughs> that makes sense. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Anybody else? No, oh dear. <laughs> I don't see a leader. I guess there's one back there somewhere. <laughs> no, there's over 20 of them. I just walked yeah. right back. with them. Come on in, guys. You guys can keep Help working around if you want. Keep coming around. There's nothing wrong with the chairs in the front row. Keep coming all the way around, too. Um, is there a, do I have a uh, motion to approve the minutes for uh, December 9th? I move that we approve the minutes from the town council meeting of December 9th, 2019. Is, is there a second? Second. All those approved? All right. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, first item um, on the uh, agenda is the alcohol legislation. Um, just uh, We've circulated um, a copy of the um, bill that has been uh, sent to um, uh, Alcar is uh, sponsor sponsoring the bill, and uh, this is the final version. But we were giving everyone an opportunity to look at it one last time. Are there any questions? I hope not, because everybody's had the time to look at it previously. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, we're at the first item on the agenda for the uh, number one, the alcohol legislation. And this is the um, a revision to the town's alcohol beverage law. Uh, Alcar is sponsoring the bill. Um, the uh, bill basically, uh, we are dropping the geographical areas in the town in which you can have uh, in the commercial areas. And we're expanding the tastings. And we will be allowing um, licenses for individuals uh, as long as they're being sponsored by a nonprofit government or religious organization to get a one day license permit. Right now, that's only allowed in this building. So we are expanding it to include, um, like, if you wanted to do it along Howard Avenue during a an event or something like that. Council, have any questions? 
I have one question. Okay. Um, I didn't. I didn't see anywhere in the where there's a fee mentioned. There's a fee mentioned for everything but alcohol liquor sale. But the annual license fee is everything else is mentioned that I could see, but just not liquor. You're talking about how much the fee costs. Right. The annual license fee is two hundred. At the at the end on page seven. Right. But my understanding is a full liquor sale license is in the $2,500 range annually. And I didn't see it anywhere in the. Is that for the county or for the town? When county. So the, when that is the county? But why are we mentioning in every other level of license but not? Valid question. There's 400 here. Right. That's beer and wine, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I can send this, send a question to Sue Ellen. Okay. okay. So your question about fees? Yeah, just, I mean, do we need to note it since hopefully there will be additional liquor, liquor licenses pulled? Okay. okay. Anything else? <clears throat> I hate to bring it up, but <laughs> on section four and you can talk two, to Algar. on page two and at the top of page three, there's off premise consumption allowed for restaurants and hotels. But then when you drop down to H through K license on page four, section 10. States at the place described in the license for on-premise consumption. It doesn't mention anything about off-premise, which it does in the other hotel designation. I don't know if we need. Again, I don't know if we need to concern ourselves with it or not. But I just it was something that jumped out at me that it was only mentioned in the one category. Okay. So your concern on page four under eleven. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, under number 10, four. that it doesn't say off-site? No, I'm, I'm, more, I mean, I'm more concerned that restaurants, hotel, well, I, I just want to, I just want to make sure that it's, cons should it be, my question is, should it be consistent for both those designation of licenses, since they both refer to hotels and restaurants? Okay. Because one, like I said, the one allows off-premise sale, the other one does not. Okay. So are these consistent? Or is there a need for consistency? Okay, is four and ten consistent or does it need to be? Okay, anything else? Okay. And then this one last question about page six, section F, uh, where it talks about displaying, not displaying inside windows or doors sign it related to liquor sales. Um, uh, is there a, I, just, I didn't okay, see what it. page? Uh, page four. four. I'm sorry, page six, page section six. F. Okay, right here. Okay. License holder whose license premise is located within the town of Kensington may not on a side door window of the building of the license premise place sign or display. Okay. But, what about it? Well, is there an allowance in the front in the front window and door? You want it in the front window and door? No. Oh, I see what you're saying. But I got you. Okay. Okay, so the question is front. But it says on a side door, so any wouldn't that mean any side, any door, any window? A side door or window? Well, now that you mentioned it, I didn't see the comma after side on any yeah, side. Yeah, so it's side, door, or window. So I think it covers it. Perhaps could we change the word from side to exterior? But then you wouldn't have the top. This is more complicated. This is working. We, we don't want, this we don't is want, written in legalese. We don't want to make changes to this. Let's remember that. Know. And it, in my view, a building has four sides, front side, back side, two sides. And so this seems to cover it. 
and I, maybe door and window is superfluous because okay. sides side. have doors in them. But and they have windows. And windows. But I would just rather limit our, if we need any amendments, limit what they are. Okay. And I just feel like <coughs> side covers it. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Right. Is there any questions from the audience that's not wearing a brown shirt with a green kerchief? <laughs> <laughs> You have to come up, Marshall. Yeah, just give your name and your street and ask your question. Marshall Presser, Prospect Street. This seems to allow signs on the exterior of the building that's not a door or window, like the roof. Well, those are those are already covered in our own okay. sign ordinances, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Um, I'll get clarity from uh, Sue Ellen. I'll get to email um, Delegate Carr and I'll CC um, the council as well as our town attorney just to get some clarity on those two issues then. Okay. Um, we all good with the... Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so glad the scouts came here tonight and the first order was alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, we're going to skip down to number three, and we're going to talk about pesticide law. So uh, Mary is here. Mary, I'm sorry, I don't I can't find my little piece of paper with your last name on it. Travelini. Travelini. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary is um, from the Department of Environmental Service uh, with the county, and uh, she or Department of Environmental Protection, and she's the program manager of the organic organic lawn and landscape program. So Mary, if I can get you to come, I'm over here. Oh. <laughs> come forward. So many sure. people in the room. <laughs> it's kind of throwing me off my game here. This um, is how all meetings are, right? Oh uh, yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the county has. You can talk about the county law, right. and uh, and why you think the town should adopt the county law. Sure. That'd be great. Uh, just and I think it's great that the scouts are here. Everybody can get a little civic lesson today. Uh, I was talking to someone on the phone today about it. So the way the county works, if you're not familiar with it, is we have indep independent municipalities like the town of Kensington. We have multiple independent municipalities, and then we have unincorporated parts of the county. The unincorporated parts of the county automatically are opted right into any county law. So the county code is the county law. And if any municipality that is incorporated wants to adopt those parts of the code, they opt in. So we have a pesticide law in the county. It's been on the books probably since the 80s, I think. But recently, there's been changes to the pesticide law. And that is restricting the use of synthetic chemicals on lawns, playgrounds, private child care facilities, and mulch recreation areas. We currently have 10 municipalities that are not opted into this part of the county code. And Kensington is one of them. Multiple municipalities that aren't opted in are considering opting into the pesticide law so that there's consistency throughout the county. And we're just coming around to each of the municipalities that is not currently opted in to see whether or not you would like to opt in. Uh, the way it works with the county laws is that we do all the education, we do all the enforcement, and there's no additional cost or burden to the town itself should they opt into the, the law. We have multiple environmental laws. Uh, Kensington has opted into several of them, including air quality and I think solid waste and several others. And then municipalities can actually even go above and beyond and do additional laws of their own. So we have some municipalities that are opted into our noise ordinance, but yet they still can go above and beyond and have their own noise uh, ordinance as well, and we work in collaboration with them. But most people in the county see it as seamless. Uh, most folks in the county kind of expect that wherever they live that the county code applies. So most people would be surprised to hear that there are some municipalities that might not be opted into some of our environmental laws. Uh, the way it works with complaints uh, and violations is it's complaint driven. All of our environmental laws, we wait for someone to call up. We don't typically go around looking for people uh, breaking the law. If our code officers are out and they see that, they will enforce it. Uh, but we usually start with education. And this is a big thing. We're the first major municipality in the United States to pass a law of this scale. In North America, the only major place that's done this is Ontario, the whole province. 
And then Tacoma Park um, several years ago adopted their own law just within Tacoma Park. But this is now on a countywide scale. Uh, so we're just checking in with uh, all of the municipalities that aren't opted in and also answering questions <coughs> that might come from the council or might come from residents about how, uh, how the county law works. I think that's enough for background probably, but I'm happy to take <coughs> questions as well. Okay. Uh, Council, do they have any questions? I have a couple. Sure. Um, you have a list of municipalities that are currently exempt with two that are considering opting in. And have other municipalities already opted in? Oh, yes. Yeah, they've, um, they've been opted in for many years. Like I said, the, it's 33B is the part of the county code. And if you went down the list and looked, many have just been opted in. Since the law was changed, now we're, we're approaching the 10 that are not currently opted in. And, um, and four of them are, two of them are, are doing, working on their paperwork, I believe, behind the scenes. And yeah. another two that I'm in conversations with, or three, four now in conversations with as I am with you about you know answering questions addressing concerns so they opted in back before it sort of went towards organic and not synthetic and mm -hmm. so they were swept into an, a, a revisions without mindfully accepting those revisions? You know, it's a great question. I can't speak to how all the municipalities have functioned over the years. I think some municipalities automatically, they may not be as organized and they might just say, we, I know we're incorporated, but just go with the county law. You know, we want them to pick up our trash, we want them to recycle, right. we want it to be seamless. And they might have just said, adopt everything. You know, okay. and then others might have come along and debated it, or also had their own ordinances in place. And and when a new ordinance came in, said, "Well, we don't need that. We've already got our own ordinance." And some municipalities like to be a lot more independent and have their own regulations and and exert their independence, which is which is fine as well. Okay, and and when in the PowerPoint you um, you write municipalities that are not currently opted into mm -hmm. 33B of the county code are being asked to opt in. Yes. And so I noticed the passive voice. Um, who is the, who's, op, who's asking? I guess I should say I'm, opt, op, I'm asking as a representative of DEP. We believe that it would bring consistency for the residents of the county. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of folks expect, especially with environmental laws, that they're being protected equally throughout the county. Okay. We also believe it would be easier to communicate, to educate, and to enforce. Uh, but again, you don't have to. We're not, we're not asking in a, this is going to be terrible if you don't kind of voice. <laughs> right, okay. I, I guess I was just trying to clarify whether the county council had spoken and put out a request or, as you just said, it's you. So I answer to the executive branch because I work through the executive branch. I would imagine that if the council was here, they, they would be asking for it. The, the count, council was the one that passed the law, so they were advocating for all the residents of the county as well as the environment of the county when they passed the law. Okay. Uh, but I, again, I, I answer to the executive. Mary, is there, is there regulation currently on the retail side of pesticide? There purchase. is regulation on the retail side, so there are, there are multiple levels of regulation in the pesticide world, and one starts with the federal level, and then you have the state level, and then you have county or municipal level. And uh, at the retail level, the state regulates the sale and distribution <coughs> of pesticides, uh, but we do have within this law regulations that require retail signage at all retailers within the county that, that explains the law so people are familiar with it. Uh, one of the interesting things about the law is that it doesn't restrict the sale of pesticides. While this is restricting the use on lawns, playgrounds, child care facilities, mulch recreation areas, it doesn't restrict its use in uh, flower gardens, in sidewalk cracks, uh, in utility right-of-ways. There, We have exemptions for poison ivy, for mosquitoes and ticks, and things like that along the way. So there may be pesticides that people still are purchasing for other uses beyond their lawns. So um, instead of restricting the sale of them, we're just making sure there's signage so people are aware of the law. And if people have these types of pesticides, like in their shed, mm -hmm. and they want to dispose of them safely rather than use them, 
does the county still provide a means to do that at the transfer yeah, station? Yeah, for free at our transfer station, yeah. seven days a week, our hazmat uh, drop-off is available Thank to you. bring all those materials there. Great. Thank you. Sure. Mary, quick question. How does enforcement work? Is it that enforcement officers are going around just hoping to see people out weeding their grass, or is it primarily through calls and reports into... It's complaint driven. Yeah. It's complaint driven. So again, if our code enforcement officers, of which we have five code enforcement officers that enforce illegal dumping, illicit discharge, mm -hmm. noise, air quality, et cetera, they, if they're out and they see something, uh, they would definitely approach the individual. We, you know, we enforce grease traps, for example. We see somebody pouring something down a drain, of course we would deal with that. But we don't have the resources to go around, and that's also not our goal with all of these laws. This is a big change for the residents of Montgomery County, and we want people to understand it and embrace it. It's a $50 civil fine, which is not very much, and we don't just go around slapping mm -hmm. civil fines on people. We're going to be approaching them with, are you aware of the law? Do you understand the law? Let me help you, you know, understand the law, and please don't do this again. And we'll, you know, we can start ramping up with bigger hammers as we go up from there. But our goal is not to just find people. So how is this effectively working? Like, if, if nobody's looking for the violations, we're not actually penalizing anyone. Like, how is this effective? I, I mean, I, I think it's an admirable goal. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of wondering, like, What's the point? Well, I, the answer is the same on all of our environmental laws. There are some environmental laws that we slap the fine on right away. You pour something down a drain, uh, restaurants are not, at, not compliant with their grease traps. Those sorts of laws that are, have been very obvious environmental laws, we will take them right to the civil fine. Um, but we need people to embrace environmental laws. And over time, the county may decide we'll have a bigger hammer on this. But the goal in the beginning is to get people to stop using synthetic pesticides and you know, protect themselves, protect the environment, understand and comply. Um, I, I like to compare it sometimes to seatbelt laws. So we drive through an area and we still see signs that say, buckle up, it's the law. I mean, it's shocking that we actually have to tell people <coughs> it's a law and remind them. Um, but that's how far we are with seatbelt laws, right? So we're in the very beginning stages of this and we're also, uh, eyes are on us as the county um, for other municipalities throughout the state and the entire country. Uh, because again, as I mentioned, we're the first ones to do this. So it really, is, I don't think it benefits us to come down with a heavy hammer before we educate people. So who, does anyone complain? Well, the law is relatively new. Uh, I've, how many people recall getting a mailer that looked like this? So I see some hands in the room. So this is the first thing that we've done to start educating people about this law. And not everybody opens every piece of mail that they get. It might have slipped with, in with something else. It might have come around the holidays and it looks like a pamphlet. So we're starting to educate people on it, but we have you know, a lot, we have a million residents in the county and we have a lot of businesses that come from outside the county as well. So we're working on the education campaign in the beginning for them to start understanding this law. I guess what I'm trying to <coughs> figure out, like other things where the county is in control, um, somebody calls the town and says, hey, I think there's an issue with pesticides. Naturally, we're gonna say, that's county. Here's the number, please contact county. Mm -hmm. It gets to you all and then it could be days later, and it's more, so, more or less hearsay from one resident calling in. Would you really go up to that property and say, hey, there was a report that somebody saw you in the dead of night shaking things on your grass, so, I mean, how does this work? Because what I'm trying to figure yeah. out for residents here is, they, if they call into town hall, we'll say, this is county. Here's mm -hmm. the number, please contact them. They contact you, they file a complaint. You all follow up on the claim, complaint, but how, would you follow up on something that is really circumstantial at best? Great question because, for example, the little yellow signs that by law a company has to put out when they mm -hmm. apply a pesticide, that doesn't mean they violated the law. So even if they put down an organic chemical under state law and under county law, they have to put that sign in the ground. So we do expect that we'll get people calling and say, well, I saw a little yellow sign. Mm -hmm. We can't necessarily follow up. So it may just be a letter to the property owner saying, hey, we just want to make sure you're complying with the law. If you weren't familiar, 
here it is. Contact us if you have any questions. Um, but th it, it's the same thing we get. I heard a generator running in the middle of the night three nights ago. So our code enforcement officers are pretty used to your scenario mm -hmm. of it, it starts getting down on the hearsay line mm -hmm. and it was five days ago. So we do our best to reach out. But if we're not right there, you know, there's again only so much evidence you could collect. And that's why going back to your question, education is really the highest priority of the county for all of our environmental laws. Is the industry itself changing as far as their chemicals? I mean, is the... You mean the chemicals that are available? Yeah. There are more and more organic chemicals that are out there, and there are more and more that are being approved at the federal level and also at the state level. So every chemical that's used in the state of Maryland has to go through the state chemist. So whether you, it's a chemical that you use to put, uh, like a paint that you use on the bottom of a boat that's an anti-fouling paint, or the dial hand soap that you use that has antimicrobials in it, those all have to go through the state chemist. And they've been approving more and more. So there's actually a fair number of organic products that are on the market, and there's more demand for them, definitely. Okay. Uh, Council, are we good? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, think, I guess there's no proposal at this point. No, I mean, this was I, a, just up for discussion about whether we want to proceed with uh, creating an ordinance and, yeah. and adopting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, my initial reaction is I'm torn. I, I like the idea of organic stuff, right? It always sounds good. Um, people know that the only thing I put on my lawn is organic from my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew that was coming. <laughs> But I just feel like when people, when you educate them enough and you're telling them, hey guys, we banned weed and feed, mm -hmm. that they might not be so happy. And, or what they might do is they might say, well, I can't hire the professional lawn care company to put that on anymore. I have to go to Stroh Snyder's and buy it myself because who's going to call me in? Well, it actually applies equally to everyone. Oh, I know it does. Oh, okay. I'm just saying I, right. I imagine your compliance rate will be higher with the big companies and some people are going to realize they kind of have to do it themselves. And I'll, the other part of me that looks at this is I don't like to be first. I like to look at what other people did and learn their reaction and learn how to avoid the pitfalls. It sounds like you can do that, right? Like Tacoma Park has its own, its own rule. They didn't wholesale jump into county. Well, I don't know. They might be more stringent than the county. Nobody's forcing you to do anything here. <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, but the option is there. You can still yeah. sort of tailor this mm -hmm. in a way where you're not. But I don't know if it is. Into, right? I mean, it, it, we're talking about jumping into, opting into the county program, which we have no control over. No, I agree. I don't think we should. I think we should make something tailor-made for us. Yeah, I mean, it, again, all the municipalities, you have the, you have the option to debate this, think it over, ask me yeah. more questions. We didn't write the law. DEP did not write the law. It came from the citizens of the county making a demand of council to create this regulation <coughs> uh, to protect the environment, protect their health, and then it was passed on behalf of the residents coming to them. So again, we're not coming out and forcing this on anyone, and you actually, I don't, I don't feel like you, I wouldn't feel like you would lose a lot of control over over things with the law. If you were to read about it, the complexity falls on us as DEP. We're, we're actually, it's a very complex law for us to enforce. And again, I don't think it, it would harm your, your citizens. But again, it's completely optional. I'm more yeah. than happy to come back and talk about it. Happy to answer questions from residents. Um, if anyone has questions, you know, after this, you're welcome to email me directly. Questions can always come through 311. You know, we have extensive websites on organic lawn care. So even if you don't adopt it, residents have access to all of our materials. We're happy to come out, provide those materials, provide talks, you name it. You know, we're there as a resource for that, too. Okay, well, we'll take a couple of questions from the I'll audience be uh, before we do one that. One last one. Okay, Just go ahead. The assumption I have, then, is you are regulating the... Uh, commercial companies that are applying products to yards, right? So, not to pick on any one yeah. company, but a True Green Chemlon or a Mosquito Squad or those mm -hmm. things that our residents might be contracting with for their yard, mm -hmm. they should feel comfortable that the county is already regulating those companies. So if they contract with those companies, the products those companies are using already meet the county standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, so again, it applies equally to contractors as well as to homeowners. 
uh, no matter who it is on your property, you know, doing it, whether it's yourself or another company, but yet they would be comfortable knowing that. And, you know, the hope is no matter what, even if some of the independent municipalities are not opted in, that those companies are providing that more and more to their customers. Okay. Um, before we go to the audience, um, do I have some adults who would like to sit down? Because we can ask some of our youngster <laughs> scouts. You guys, you good? Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, two seats just opened up, though. <laughs> they insist. Front. <laughs> Thank you, boys. Uh, does anybody in the audience have a question? Uh, if you do so, please come forward and just give your name and your street. No? <laughs> well, can I just sit here? I'm really numb. Well, you can't because it's being recorded. I, I know. I can repeat it. Okay. Just yeah. what's the exception for mosquitoes and... Great. So the question was, what's the exemption for mosquitoes? So there are exemptions for biting and stinging in insects. So there would be no restrictions. All state and federal laws would still apply for chemicals that are used for biting insects. But most, right? But but many of the vendors are already using organic products. Fair for, number of them are. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's actually, the, it's a lot easier in the insect and fungi world okay. than it is in the weed world. There's a lot more organic alternatives in that world already. But, but yes, many of them are still also using synthetics. Okay, and for the record, that question did come from Ruth Spivak, so just for the record. Uh, any other questions from the audience? You can come up front. Come on. Come on. You're going to get a badge if you come up front. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Just give your name and the street you live on, not the address, just the street. Um, uh, I live, uh, I, I, my name is Sean Mockin and I live on Clearbrook Lane. Okay. Uh, I, I was going to ask, like, uh, I, I, can I have one of the pamphlets? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you didn't get the mail or I have a couple other pamphlets here, I also brought a few of our um, fall, summer, and, and spring organic lawn care uh, pamphlets, and I can get plenty more out there as well, but yes. Sean, do you cut your grass? Uh, you uh, cut? Not personally. We hire someone. Who okay. <laughs> Future job. That's right. <laughs> Anybody else from the audience have a question? Did he get a badge? <laughs> sure, him. I would give him a badge. How many of them do cut their grass <laughs> and stay after? <laughs> I, I see one hand. <laughs> okay. All right, Mary, thank you so much. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for Mary. coming today. Sure. Um, Council, we have a, um, well, do you want to continue to look into this? Uh, we have a work session on the 22nd. We can discuss this further if you yeah. want at the work session. Matt, if you and just jot that down. Great, thank you. I already have that. Okay. And if the town, if the council decides to move forward with uh, adoption of the county law, we, it'll be on in the agenda item uh, at a future town meeting. That's where we are right now. Thank you. Okay, well, let's go down to uh, number four, uh, Historic Preservation Committee. Um, this is a discussion only. We are not taking any action tonight, but um, recently uh, Matt and I had a chance to meet with Rebecca Bala, who's the supervisor of the Historic Preservation Commission staff, and to talk about um, how the uh, local advisory panel is structured and what they do and how they report and, um, and the options of bringing this uh, committee under the umbrella of the town in order to um, bring more transparency to how it works and um, make more organized meetings and, um, and a council member would be a liaison on there and possibly expanding the membership. Um, Connor, did you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, um, quite personally, I've recently, well, I'm still in the midst of going through it, and so it's been very highlighted to me. Um, one of the things that came out most of all was just the reality that our historic district is such a key element uh, of our identity and of what Kensington is, and the historic properties that are in it are the things that we tout all over marketing and, and all over the town, and so they are really one of the, the jewels of, of our town. and. There is a process when one who owns a historic property wants to renovate that property or add on to that property, they have to go through this process that largely belongs to the county, but there is a, a local aspect of it. And as I've been going through it and talking to other neighbors who have gone through it, what we've come to realize is that it is a process that other municipalities have taken 
under um, the municipal government structure as a committee and they put more structure to it and uh, taken the county guidelines and more rigorously applied them. And as I looked at and talked to people from Garrett Park and other jurisdictions that are doing this, I realized that seems like a, they've taken a larger step to uh, put their arms around and control the historic district in a very purposeful way that I think Kensington should look at as well. That, that you know, we, ID, you know, we identify so much with our historic district that I think it, the whole process could be improved both for the town and for the historic property owners by bringing it under a, a committee structure. Council, any other questions? No, I, I welcome the discussion. I, I think that there are uh, people, I, fortunately, one of the smartest things I did when I moved to this town was not bought within the historic district. <laughs> um, and I, but I've heard so many war stories from people who go through the process and I, I've been on the council now for, what is it, six years? And I didn't know about them. And I didn't know about the lack of notice of meetings, the lack of any sort of procedural me uh, process for these things that are very influential at the Historic Preservation Commission level. Um, and so I think it would be critical for us, if we're going to say that we support transparency and fairness and process, to bring it within the town auspices. Yeah, I believe the only thing right now that the town currently does is we appoint members to the LAP, and it's usually at the request of the LAP that needs members, yet it's been some confusion over, you know, where are those members listed and who are they, and we don't have that written down anywhere. And we, so I think that's part two of very important that um, they have a page on our mm -hmm. website in order for people to understand the process a little bit more. Right. And obviously, we are not the body in which that information, their recommendations, goes to the Historic Preservation Commission. They don't typically would come to the council. So we're just basically would be providing the LAP, um, as you said, an organizational structure mm -hmm. in which to work under. So hopefully it will function a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? I think. No, Probably uh, we should do an ad hoc committee to kind of set this up and to discuss what we would need to do in order to get it into the structure that we think would, would work and what would need to go on the website and the guidelines yep. and that sort of thing. Right. And, you know, the county has largely many of these guidelines that are established. Um, it's just getting them to be it's adhered to, put in a way, place. Just, yeah. um, and, and it is to a property owner who's spending a considerable amount of money going through this process. Um, the way the county process works is that, you know, you have to schedule public meetings at the county level. And at times, you know, through numerous residents I've talked to, the comments from the local area didn't mean, didn't come until moments before, sometimes, you know, 30 minutes, an hour before, um, and, and sometimes caught them by surprise. And I just think there's a, a rigor in a process that we can put and that I think we owe the historic property owners in our town to just make that, that process more efficient and effective and timely. And we did receive two emails um, today from people who have been through the process and the additional expense uh, by the process not working is just enormous. And I think we can, can help out in that too. Um, is there anybody in the audience who has a question? You need to come forward, Leslie. You don't get excused. <laughs> Leslie Olson, Wheatley Street. Um, just for immediate information, the Kensington Historical Society is having a meeting tomorrow night mm -hmm. at 7, and they're going to discuss um, a lot of these issues. It's just a presentation for people who are in historic districts, et cetera, running them through the process. So, um, And there's a lot of, of things out there, too, because people are interested in solar panels. And that's like a new topic that um, is kind of not, um, not on anybody's radar. So. Um, there are a lot of things that um, will be coming up. Yeah, if you live in a historic home, this tomorrow night's meeting with the Historical Society will be a very good meeting. The um, um, planning, uh, the historical HPC um, staff will be present and they will be giving the presentation and they can talk about the tax credits that you receive, they can talk about 
um, the other things that people are dealing with, like having, having to put solar panels or wanting to put solar panels on their house. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Helen Wilkes, chair of the Is this on? It's on. Okay, local advisory panel. And uh, yes, it's true that reports are oftentimes uh, later than they ought to be. I want um, to state that I fully support this idea that the LAP would come uh, within the fold of the towns as a committee, uh, part of the Historic Preservation Committee. Um, I, for the years that I've been involved with the LAP, have asked Historic Preservation Commission staff to provide greater structure um, to our group on LAPs, and there's a bit of a hands-off attitude. Um, it hadn't occurred to me to, that, that the town would want to take it on, <laughs> honestly. Um, but because the LAP local advisory panel is advisory to the Historic Preservation Commission, and we give advice to applicants when it is requested, um, and we could have done a better job, no question, but I think more structure would be better for the um, group. And there's a lot, by the way, that the LAP does beyond just the reports, which is includes going to uh, visit people within the historic district to talk about what um, what are the guidelines. We adhere also to the uh, Secretary of the Interior standards, and there is some understanding there. But just as at the HPC level, there is um, not necessarily concurrence with what um, the commissioners themselves agree upon. The LAP doesn't necessarily agree with what is uh, heard at the HPC level. So I can understand the conflicts, and that's a conundrum. Frankly, it is a conundrum, and I don't know that that's going to stop necessarily because the LAP is within a town committee. Um, however, if the town is able to provide greater structure to the process, transparency, um, I think it's all good, and I fully support it. Good. I, th I mean, I think that's the goal, and I think, do you think the committee needs to be expanded? I believe there are four people now currently serving. Um, yeah, I'm, I have no problem with that idea. It's not exactly easy to find people who are willing to I devote understand. the time, and there is a certain <coughs> level of expertise and willingness to devote it to understanding the guidelines, the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines, the Historic Preservation Ordinance, et cetera. Zoning code even comes into it. Um, so, yeah, I'm sounds great okay well I think people don't you know know about the advisor unless you've been through it right. don't know about it and I think the yeah. town can help get that word out and really um, provide the guidelines and provide the the necessary information to people so that maybe we can make it work a little better all that's good okay and, uh, two questions since you are chairing Helen does the county provide any sort of boot camp to yeah. LAPs no, I've, I mean, I've offered even to put together some kind of an LAP workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't even aware that other LAPs are within their... When we talk to Rebecca, they pretty much can do whatever they want, right. and, and it's, it is, right. I mean, they have the guidelines there, but they don't, you're right, they don't monitor them. They're just whatever they want to do, and she did say, you know, and I think another problem is when you're not keeping, somebody's keeping tabs is that uh, they had a thing where one of the LAPs, the mem uh, one member had died and one had moved, and they were still sending them stuff. You know, so, I mean, that's the thing that's just yeah. needs so, to be fixed. So they've been a bit too hands-off. Right. Is, the, is the, the, the thing that is true, that mm -hmm. we can all agree, is not a good thing. Well, I believe they've already changed where the comments from the LAP needs to come in at least 24 hours or 48 hours yeah, before a meeting party. now. That is Fair. one thing that they this are. This is the first I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. well, they Even just talked kind of about direction. it at the meeting last week, so I don't know if it's official yet, but um, the commissioner who will be here tomorrow uh, yeah. will, you know, you could talk about that as yes, well. And I just I want to mention that um, for the Historical Society, I'm going to be uh, chairing the meeting tomorrow night and talking about the role of the LAP. So. Good. But it is very helpful for anybody who lives in the historic district and has property there to come and, and uh, or practices within the historic district to come and um, participate in that. It'll be a better discussion. So the last question I have, uh, let's say this goes down the path and becomes a committee and then to your point, you know, we love our volunteer committee members but there's work that goes into it and there's time that needs to be dedicated. Okay. How many uh, 
applications do you ru does the LEP roughly see? I mean, that, I don't mm -hmm. know if there's a fair way to ask well, that. Well, I mean, there's the building, sort of a building, you know, when people are thinking about their projects, mm -hmm. it tends to run toward, you know, early in January, which is why we're doing the workshop in January, because um, I think people are thinking about projects. So it tends to run through the sort of with the building uh, season, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it, you know, it goes all year. So it can be anything from very small changes to the front of a house, are those being taken away though? Uh, now staff will be approving those. Yeah, they're working that out. Um, and I've, you know, I've done a walking tour of the historic district here a couple of times with the staff um, of the HPC to point out some of the little things that I've heard neighbors upset about um, when something got built, even though it se might seem like a small thing, like the stairs that go from the property down to the street which are not conforming with sort of the consistent, you know, the, the pattern of the types of stairs or whatever. Um, it, <coughs> as silly as it may sound to some people, there is a uniformity uh, within the historic district that is people care about the, the, the of scale, et cetera, et cetera. Not worth going into here, maybe tomorrow night. Um, <laughs> but um, at any rate, uh, I'd say maybe um, at least a dozen to two dozen applications per year, I'd say with varying degrees of um, input needed. Okay. And last question, I have. historic homes, our historic district includes homes that are deemed primary historic resources, which is generally 1930 and before, right. and then those that are secondary or contributing historic resources. But the rules still apply to all homes within the, um, the historic district. They all district. are subject to review because the historic district is considered to be a collection of homes with an environmental setting, and which is why so, yep. all homes, but that means that all homes within the historic district are all also able to get uh, tax, tax credits, credits for preserving the exterior Both of the But state. a secondary home or a non, um, it can be a they, they're not as scrutinized as... No, right. No. There's greater lenience, but right. they can get tax credits for pres because they're protecting the historic district. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, I, I just have yeah. one uh, thing that we want to think about going forward, and that is um, traditionally our committees um, make a recommendation to the council, which then decides whether to approve or not. This committee it has answers the potential to, the HBC. to direct. And so I'm not sure, uh, well, I, I, if, if we have flexibility on that, I at least want us to be thinking about, do we want to be talking to the HPC directly, or do we want to create this committee within the town that would speak independently of us? Well, if, if they're doing a plan, that plan would eventually come to the town, uh, especially if they have a problem. If there's an issue, a variance, or, <laughs> I, no, I'm serious, we've, we've reviewed plans of homes in the historic yes, district. But that's, that's, that's after the HOP process. The HOP process is kind of first mm -hmm. because people have to figure out whether they're going to be allowed to okay. do something um, in terms of the historic district. And then they have to go through the building permit process. So you're saying that's when they come? Because I remember that yeah. window that was over a certain... Unless you change it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, certainly I think that these other municipalities must have some... Well, you said Garrett yeah, Park Yeah, Garrett has Park it. has a, a process. I mean, what comes to mind immediately, um, having gone through this process, is just that the HPC, the commission at the county level, meets twice a month. And so we only meet once a month. And we will have to figure out how our process can overlay into that process without causing you know, delays, mm -hmm. right, so that um, people aren't coming midstream and then having to wait for our meeting and then, it, you know, because that just compounds and now you're, you've waited five weeks. But I don't think this body should be reviewing that. I mean, the recommendations should be going right to the HPC. But I think that's part of the discussion we should have. Yeah, and, and if we trust that the H, a, a town-level historic preservation committee has the appropriate you know, members with their credentials and their experience that their recommendations, you know, would Because would I, be the I mean, we can just forward. muddy the waters. That right. would be my concern. Well, I heard from them and I heard from them and now you're telling me this and they're mm -hmm. telling me that. I mean, I don't think. I'm all for creating some structure, but I don't want to take an administrative role in this at yeah, all. Yeah, I don't yeah. think we should. No, I, and I don't think that that's, my recommendation would not be that. It would be more that 
whatever council member is the <coughs> liaison of that committee simply reports out during the council hearing that hey the Kensington Historic Preservation Committee reviewed such and such plans at such and such addresses and but would the, you make that contingent upon them going to the next no meeting? no it's just a it is an informative back to the council process it's reporting out and otherwise I think it does stifle and slow down the work of the LAP and then the property owner to HPC at the county. Yeah, because I mean, I kind of view it as like the DRB. You're reviewing mm -hmm. a plan, you follow the guidelines, but you're, the body you're reporting to is the HPC, mm -hmm. not this body, mm -hmm. HPC body. And they're the ones with the control. We have no control yeah, yeah. at that level. And it, unless there were a time where there was a request for the council to do something, send a letter of support, or if that is something that were to be done in a historic preservation case, um, then obviously that would come before the council for consideration, right? right. Well, let's, so. let's think about it because um, I think if we compare it to the other committees, um, we, didn't, we didn't want the Development Review Board making recommendations to the county, Park and Planning. Um, if there's a proposal for, you know, a, a new triangle in Montgomery Avenue or an island, um, as much as I think I like traffic, um, I brought it here. And, and even if we're not really experienced with it, you guys get a say on it. And I, I'm not sure I want to give up the review because I feel like the level of engagement, I mean, Boy Scouts aside, <laughs> people, <laughs> people who come to these meetings are far more than I think have ever gone to an LAP meeting and probably more than have ever gone to a Historic Preservation Commission meeting. And so if stuff is happening, and if people, if applicants are feeling like whiplash from, they said this to me this month and this to me the next month, um, I, I would like to, to know about it. I think you're just creating another sovereign. You're just creating another layer of complexity. I'm all for creating the infrastructure. I'm, I want to help residents, but I certainly don't want to create. But if it can help and support, because I will say this, the HBC is kind of a one layer process and it is its own level of complexity and it right. doesn't necessarily yeah. always make sense I agreed mean, well especially when you're, you're, you're going into the planning staff who have a pretty right. strong weight on the scale mm -hmm. uh the planning staff um they're 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 the group that you really should <laughs> if they're happy then usually the commissioners are happy well, not not always not always but not the ones i've be been to Yes, but I've I've been to. You've probably been to a lot HPC more, right? Is convinced enough otherwise because one person made an argument that right. didn't agree with what the staff had said. Right. So, I mean, it can go. It gets complex at it, either level. But, but I I, I just think. don't think we should be sitting there weighing on. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that porch. What no. do you think of that porch? Should we put the porch on? No, yeah, yeah, not not at all. we're not nothing, for the porch. Nothing you know, prevents just, us right now in our current yeah. roles from doing everything you're talking about. Yeah. You know, like. I don't well, think why we need establish a committee and all that if we're not going to have any control whatsoever the control is con is the structure right. and the guidelines to, to assure people that because these meetings are going to take place that a report yeah. is going to get yeah. out and that you know when uh, you have a liaison council person who is making sure that the information is getting out there and it's on the website so people can well what the heck is the LAP or whatever we need infrastructure sure and consistency is yeah. the service yeah. that you're giving to your consist your constituents I don't want to do anything that's seen as a power grab in this I think that is a quagmire well, but but to Helen's point she said well one commissioner one made an argument that overrode staff and to me, that sounds like randomness and an unfair application of competing factors that they weigh independently. I feel like if we as a town council, through transparency and notice and everybody gets a chance to say things, go to them and say, we support this project, <coughs> that the applicant is less likely to face this random, oh, I think that's too big. Or no, it's oh, not it's, like it's that. Wait, the, yeah. first of all, you're giving a, maybe an impression that the LAP is random because we're not. I no, I think he's talking about HPC. The okay, H but even H the HPC is it's professionals, but this is by its nature a subjective process interpretation of guidelines. 
And I, I don't think we should belabor that here because I'm, I'd be happy to explain what I mean by that, but I could give you a case example of how that works, at, or two. Okay. Um, but it's, the, the, that's the problem. It is a subjective process. And so there is a, it's not randomness, but there is um, subjectivity to the process. And so a good argument by an architect on the HPC or on the LAP um, might make a difference in the way the argument goes, or it might not. In this process, in the, when you're getting a hop, I, you, I know you have to inform all the neighbors that are immediately around you. Well, I'm just saying, is that before you do. guys have looked at it or after you've looked at we it? We don't have to. The, that's done by the HPC. No, no, I know that. But, I mean, when are you informing your neighbors about Immediately. Your, at the immediately. Beginning, yeah. So and when okay. the notice is given of the meeting, right. yeah, that it goes, I, I'm not even sure how they send the notices to by email now. The, the process is also <coughs> changing from you know, paper to electronic right now. So there, there's that aspect. I mean, I think the people who are, are, uh, could be on, um, I'm sorry, I lost the word, but if they could be affected mm -hmm. by whatever change I'm doing to my house, they've already been notified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think somebody on the north side needs to worry about what I'm doing on the west side exactly. mm -hmm. by adding on a second and room. Nothing prevents us from writing these letters of support or not. Right. Like, where well, I think, I, sorry, where I, where I see Darren's comment is um, thinking at the HPC level, you know, with the LAP <clears throat> now as a, if it's a formal committee of the town and it gets reviewed and it says, hey, we really like this. We think it really contributes to our historic district. We think it's a great way to breathe new life into this house. Um, we think it, 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 it meets the standards of the, the vision of our historic district and we really want, you know, we're in support of this. That's the kind of weight that I wanna see applied to the process at the HPC level because in the ones I've sat in on and reviewed, what I did see was the HPC applying their um, expertise to historic preservation, but when it comes to the historic preservation and what is the vision of that specific historic district, they don't live there. And they don't really know what, what the vision of that historic district is, whereas the local does. And that's why that part of influence is important. <laughs> I need letters right. of support from every one of you. <laughs> and I guess the last thing I, I would say at this point, because we're not proposing any changes, is something's got to be different. Because we put this on the agenda, and we got two um, earnest letters from people who felt like the process didn't work, didn't treat them fairly, wasn't transparent. If anybody in the audience here feels like they went through a home renovation in the historic district and you were treated fairly and con reliably and consistently, let us know. Because right now we're batting 2-0 the other way. <laughs> Marshall, you want to give your example? Uh, there it is. Uh, so I live in, I'm Marshall Presser, I live in Prospect Street. I live in a historic house. Uh, it has gone through, I don't know how many historic area work permits to do such things as add a window that is literally six inches wide by three feet long. Was I treated fairly? Um, I think I was treated fairly. I thought, um, as Helen mentioned, there's sort of subjective interpretations of what is and what is not appropriate. That's the first thing. Um, on the other hand, I did a non-footprint changing renovation of the kitchen that involved refenestration on the side and the back of the property, and I thought I was given a fairly good hearing. And when I had to do something with the roof and with the gutters, it was pretty pro forma. If I wanted to put uh, an accessory building on the lot adjacent to the house that I own. Um, I think I would get a lot of grief from the Historic Preservation Commission. And I also think, it's been my experience, that the composition of the commission changes over time. And there are certain commissions that, um, how to phrase this, interpret things differently than other commissions. Some are much more stringent. 
some are much less stringent, some care about only the front facades, and even though the Department of Interior says you should consider the side facade, and no one cares about the rear facades, except every once in a while someone cares about the rear facades. <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I think you can get a fair representation at the HPC. Thank you. And um, you know, you may not like the representation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Marshall, quick question though. Yes. Did it, how much extra time did it add to the process? How much extra money did it add to the process? Um, As percentages, I mean it. <coughs> so I think um, in terms of the small window that I wanted to add, uh, it added um, one or two extra sets of architectural drawings. That are thousands of dollars each? I don't think so, they were, they were less expensive than that. Okay. I got the right just one window. Uh, no, that uh, uh, it slowed down the process no end. But on the other hand, I have seen um, renovations um, that were in the historic district that I would have thought, and I think others would have thought, would have been better had they been slowed down to an infinitely slow slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, it does. That, that's the price of living in the historic district, is that there is historic overview of the, of the projects that you want. And these, you know, this is not like living out in Houston with no zoning. Okay. okay. And there's not necessarily consensus, even among residents, I guess, on, you know, what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And nor is there consensus on the commission itself. I and mean, there are lots of three right. votes. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. But we can facilitate things by creating the system. Which I think that the administrative system is service. the only thing I think that I was uh, interested in. I did not want to get into <laughs> approving <laughs> some. I know, right? Tracy, what's happening? <laughs> yes, ma'am. You, you got to come forward. Just give your name and. Okay. Is it okay that I don't live in Yeah, no, you don't have to. Hi, Open Margaret, meeting. Margaret Upton with Upton Architecture. I'm an architect who lives in Parkwood. Um, but I work. I've done <coughs> projects and worked with the LAP. One point that I would like to make is the, the, the commission, the county commission, treats every town the same. So they want the same thing done in, in a historic project in Kensington as Chevy Chase, as wherever else the historic districts are. The LAP is very in tune to Kensington, very specific to Kensington. One example with the county council or board is you know, one of the things that almost every commissioner advises is we don't want to see it from the front facade. And when you're doing architectural drawings, they're very unrealistic because unless you're doing a 3D drawing because you're just seeing one, L, one side at a time and you don't see the project holistically. So, if they're looking at just the front elevation and saying, well, I can't see any roof above it. In reality, if the roof is the same height and you step to the side, you're going to see the roof. If it's a little lower, if it's a little higher, if it's higher and you're standing on the sidewalk, you probably won't be able to see it. I just think it's unrealistic. I think the Kensington LAP looks at it more holistically with the plan for Kensington where uh, embracing the open space of Kensington if there was a way, you know, this is not realistic, that the LAP, the local advisory panel, had more weight and the county, which is very generic throughout all of Montgomery County, had less weight. You know, if we could say, look, that's fine in Silver Spring or um, Silver Spring. Garrett Park or the Garrett same issue Garrett Park. But that's not right for Kensington. And what Kensington wants is what we feel is going to be a better building. You know, one perfect example is, you know, when we're doing a building with a peak roof or a style that would be appropriate to the style of the building, the Victorian character, we can't usually put something that would be appropriate to that character on because we can't get it approved by the county. The LAP 
may say, yes, I understand exactly where you're coming from, and that is more sensitive to the building. But in the county, it's a little more black and white, I, in my experience, where they say, oh, sorry, I can see that side gable from the street. No. You know, so then we end up compromising the design to avoid what they feel would be taking away from the historic property, but I feel the LAP sometimes can see that as enhancing the property. So, that's all. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, full disclosure for the record, Margaret is my architect, and she was <laughs> not paid to be here tonight. <laughs> 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 Anybody else in the audience want to make a comment? No? Okay. Um, does the council want to uh, form an ad hoc committee to uh, look into, I think we sh should meet with the members of the LAP and um, try to figure out, you know, what we could do to assist them in um, bringing some administrative assistance to the group and, okay, any? <laughs> I think we can do that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's the direction we'll go in, and we'll uh, announce a meeting. Um, we'll probably uh, just bring that up in the work session real quick, and then put together an ad hoc committee for that as well, so everybody can think about how they want to participate. <laughs> Give you time. Okay. Great. All right. We're going to move on. I will go back up to number two. Council, you have. Um, I'm glad the uh, Boy Scouts left. Did, did, any, did any of these get around? Um, get yeah, one? I think we all have no, I know you guys do. I was going here. You can send the big one around. Are they over there? That, well, we didn't make tons of copies for everybody just because. Yeah, please explain. Well, this is something that Greenscape started, and uh, we're going to be meeting again. But I wanted to, before we get too far, uh, send it around to the council and see what your thoughts are, because it's a little bit different. Uh, Gloria Capron has been working with Carrie Ann to come up with these different banners. And the original thinking was to put them on the poles, the light poles along Howard Avenue. Yeah. And, but with the trees and the banners are meant to be, you know, you. Typically, banners are like the same thing over and over and over again. So you can kind of, you know, you just see one and then the expectation it's the same, the same, the same. This is more promoting the art in Kensington. So it seemed to lend itself more to be um, put on display separately. But like that? Well, this is a just. A <laughs> I'm confused. I Wait, what are you confused stand. about? Well, she doesn't want her poles in a park. Well, th but that, yeah, but also it was like, it was hard to, like, I didn't know what I was supposed to look at when I look at it. Like, I'm not okay. an art person. I don't. Obviously. No, no, like, <laughs> I don't have the design brain, so <laughs> forgive me for being slow, but I just, I didn't know what it was, what I was supposed to get out of it. What you're supposed to get out of it is that this town is probably painted more than any other town because of the uh, Montgomery Art Association meeting here every <laughs> year <laughs> and painting pictures of the town. So every picture, and this is just the beginning, of their, uh, Margaret's got a, all of them, are all town of Kensington <laughs> paintings. Okay. They're paintings of the town by different artists. And the point is to promote the town through art. Art. Huh? Fine. Fine. Well, that was not my idea. Hot <laughs> potato. I mean, the, the paintings are beautiful. And I'll shut up right there. So, the question is how do you display them? Because they really are meant to be seen kind of in a cluster, not hanging on a pole. So, this was a suggestion on how to do it. And you would put them in different sections of the town. And this wouldn't be forever, it would be just on a short period. Think of Christoph at the 
in, at the, at the at, monument. Yeah. No, yeah, at the monument or in New York Central Park or right. something where you put orange with, with material all over the place. Yeah. yeah. So think of that. Can you think of that? I'm sure. I hate it so much. I really, I really want to like it. I really do, but I like intensely hate it. And that's, and that's why we're here because I'm certainly not going to go. Think of Strathmore. Strathmore. They have those there you four go. different banners yeah. promoting what they yeah, do. Yeah, right. like white hot heat. Hate it. <laughs> yes, Dwayne. I'm with Bridget on this. I mean, I, I for years I've really, really wanted to see this type of banner on our <laughs> Howard Avenue poles. Not all of them necessarily, but you know, every other whatever. But I don't, mm. I don't like this notion of this of different multiple signs in the parks. I don't like that at yeah. all. Like nobody gets it. I don't okay, it. Yeah. I mean that's why we're here. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Let's. So I I like walking by Safeway and seeing the display in the windows. Yeah, that's nice. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't have enough of those windows sure. to do that. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm, I, I, it just blends in, and, right. and it, it, you don't have to look at it if you don't want to. But if you happen <laughs> to look at it, it's nice in my view. Um, uh, so I don't think we're actually proposing these big signs in the park. Are you sure about that? But um, to the extent we can find other places to highlight art, I'm all for that. Even though I'm not an art person. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe, you know, you know that opening in the wall along the tracks across from Mario's gas station. Yeah. Maybe. Lovely. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Along a fence of the dog, dog room. Park. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. The art is Well, I think I think I think the question it's not necessarily the placement, it's it's more the cluster. <laughs> We used Reinhardt Park because it was outside and easy to get to. <laughs> Maybe I should have Take a picture had, of the yeah, office or what? I know, send Carrie Ann down to the opening at the... Um, uh, but I guess the concept, is there any thoughts on the concept of the... of? I really liked the polls. I thought that was awesome. I've the polls? That. Yeah, the polls on Howard Ave. Like, yeah, the problem with the poles is you, because of the trees, you're not going to really appreciate the banner. Well, nobody's I know gonna, where like this writing is so small. Nobody's going to appreciate that. Period. You don't even. Well, like that's actually a six foot banner. I think they will see it, but that's that's okay. Yeah. If we put yeah. these along Connecticut Avenue, above Washington Street, all the way up to Knowles, people have nothing to do but look at them. Yeah. <laughs> and we can have each of them be different because they'll have plenty of time to catch up. We don't need like a Burma shave. <laughs> Anybody from the audience want to say a po something positive? <laughs> positive girl. Come oh. yes. Sharon Scott over on street. Um, I like the idea, but what are we trying to do with it? We're trying to promote people coming into Kensington. Correct. I mean, it's kind of like a, it's, and, and I was serious with the Kristoff thing. It's coming to see the art in Kensington. That's right. why it would be around and, you know, and clustered. Okay. The people that we want to draw are not on Howard Avenue. They're already there. Mm -hmm. So why don't we, literally on Connecticut Avenue, I'm, I'm agreeing, they're going to see them and ad nauseum because they're never going to move. Um, but if we do it there and they're going through town, they're going, huh, I wonder what's on the other side of the yeah. Safeway that I wasn't thinking That's about. Yeah. And I think that would be the far better <coughs> place to put it. Yeah, the only place, we could actually. probably do it at the Baker's Union. I think on, um, you know, I, maybe the, we'd have to check the right of way, but with uh, like uh, Warner Memorial, I'm not sure there's space there. Um, yeah. where, where we put it, I don't really know, but I, I think we need to grab the attention of people that are using us as a cut-through to say there's more than the cut-through. Yeah. Okay. 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 And, and <coughs> if I can just change the subject sure. a little since I'm already up here. I well, asked a couple of times <coughs> that you all consider going north on Connecticut Avenue in front of, uh, right before Plyers Mill, that you make a right-hand turn lane. That's going to take several years, and I'd like to know we're working on that. That will happen when that property redevelops. Okay. 
but I mean, that's how long it took to do it outside of, of Walter Reed. It was literally two years. It'd be really nice if it got on the book sooner. Well, SHA time. knows that we would like to have it, but it will require moving um, the um, a lot of electrical. A lot of electrical. Else, which and they years. would like to on the the last of uh, the uh, self storage, which is no longer. They yes. yeah, that's gone. Yes. Um, they did not. They wanted SHA wanted to take away that entrance on that side, and that would allow. Uh, I'm not sure that's a good thing for that property, but. Um, you know, but we need that right turn. No, I understand. Okay, I understand. But not until there's development. Well, they they're not even going to want to talk about it because well, they're going to want the. If I don't say it, it won't get done. I know. So I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may still not get it done. But still <laughs> not get done. <laughs> it has a bigger chance of getting done. If yeah. says it. If it gets done, not, take credit for it. Yeah. Oh, you know I will. <laughs> Um, Leslie Olson, Wheatley Street. So I like the idea. I think a lot of the artwork is really nice. And um, I, I, I don't think it um, shows itself well to be around that little sand. Well, I as know, I said, I this was just what was outside. But a linear, you know, there's so much activity up by the train station. So even having it along wherever we could put it along the tracks, uh, for the, it's the market. We've got all these festivals that have a lot of activity there. Um, you know, that would be something. To have it several places and have half a dozen or whatever um, group like that, I think, would be real attractive. Because if you don't see it there, you'll see it on Connecticut. That's a, you know, a great spot. So I like the concept, and I think um, more in a linear aspect okay. um, in several places would, um, yeah, would be good. Okay, thank you. And this is all going to go back to Greenscape because they're the ones that are going to try to look for placement of the of the banners, or can the whole thing, <laughs> which would disappoint Gloria tremendously because she's worked really hard on it. What are they made of? What, what are they made of? Uh, probably a vinyl, or you could get a some kind of cloth. Cloth, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody else comments? Okay, thank you. And thank you for all your support. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Art hater. Look. <laughs> in her defense, she's the only one here who bought art off the wall here. That what? what? She bought Oh, she art. did. She bought art I off did. the wall. Of the gas station. Of the gas station. Thank you very much. I did. I love that painting. I don't care. I love that painting. Uh, you were t you, you waited too news. long. Yes. I know. Nice news. Okay, <laughs> so before we uh, leave and go down from the town manager and the staff, uh, council, anything uh, you would like to report, uh, Councilmember Bartram? Anything? I have nothing to add. Okay. No man. All right. Um, I will remind everybody. So I'd like to see a good turnout. This is not open to the public, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this is uh, all the municipalities in Montgomery County get together and, and yak. Okay? All right. And then I would remind you, and this is open to the community, is the Wheaton Kensington Chamber is having their expo here on January 29th from 5.30 to 8, and that is open to the community, and there'll be lots of businesses here and uh, restaurants who will be offering food samples, so it is a great event, so love for people to come out. Um, Dwayne, anything? I'm just going to ask again, um, for the record, about are we planning on placing any additional recycling containers in the town during 2020 fiscal year? Any more? Yeah. You mean in addition to, or well, you feel that there weren't enough? I know we've talked about the train station. Were there other locations? The train station, I think there's a need for one in front of the sweatshop because uh, every time I look in the receptacle containers, the okay. trash receptacle containers around the gym area, they are chock full of plastic and aluminum cans. Is it I think it's a lot of folks who are coming out of the gym and farmers market. They can't take them home. That's what I do. I've got like no. four or five bottles running around my car. Yeah. <laughs> Word. Word. And then you know, wherever else we can afford to put them. Okay. 
Okay. Anything else? No. Thank okay. you. Connor? Uh, just a couple of um, kudos. One to Mark Hudson for helping to organize the first caroling around the fountain back in December, which was a huge hit. It was a great night, and we roasted marshmallows, and we uh, sang around the fountain. It was a good time. Uh, but thanks to Al and many others who helped put it together and then obviously make it take it away when it was over. Um, and then uh, the others to Matt, just to, there was a huge pothole on Metropolitan yeah. that had a shoddy fat patch by SHA. Uh, but I called Matt and I think within hours he got SHA to come back and do better work. There's a, sorry, there's a huge one on Players Mill North also How far between uh, Summit and... By the fire station. Oh, sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah, we're having issues with it. There's an underground leak. Uh, it's ours. Uh. Leak, leak. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Has it eaten a car yet, or uh, just? Mm. It's been ongoing for a few years. Okay. I knew I'd avoid the area. <laughs> <laughs> Take a deep breath. Yeah, I build them up <laughs> and tear them down, huh? Find as long as we're on it, there's, a, there's also a growing <laughs> pothole in, at the end of Dietrich okay. and Howard. Dietrich and Howard. Hmm. Okay. Well, Dietrich's brand new. No, it's on Howard. On Howard? Okay. Yeah. That was just done last year. Okay. Any other pothole requests while we're, mm -hmm. while we're on it? Okay. Or just plain old pot? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's my department. Now, now. <laughs> okay. Um, anything on the Jason and the Bears? Are they. The Bears look great. Anybody seen the Bears in St. Paul Park? I work at the gas station and people talk about the Bears all the time. They talk about the Bears? They do. Several, uh, it, okay. Yes. Right. Not, real bear. not real bears, right? The, the, the oh, wood oh, bears? Not real bears. Not just, not, just, <laughs> yeah. not, just one, not just the one inside the station. No. no. The one's over the park. Yeah, uh, Jason got the bench on over the weekend. It's mm. a little higher than I thought, but I was like, well, actually, that'll make a good bar area, you know, with <laughs> it, yeah. if you're entertaining in the uh, pavilion. I will say uh, to all the kids I play in St. Paul Park, <coughs> mine included, uh, it's become kind of a thing that when you score a touchdown, you go over and high five the bear. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so. Nice. Okay. Mm. Well, I know he's, uh, he wants to finish it up. They look really cute. And uh, I know every time he's over there working on them, he just draws this huge crowd <laughs> of people. And uh, so he's very excited about it. So um, one item I did want to bring it up, and uh, it's uh, maybe I should bring it up during public appearances, but uh, we were going to discuss uh, briefly the grocery cart problem mm -hmm. at uh, the bridge, mm -hmm. uh, which... Um, we're assuming, but uh, some of our residents uh, who do not have cars um, take the carts back to uh, their apartment and then they just dispose of them at the bridge. And our crew is getting a little uh, frustrated at being the ones who are always having to go and retrieve them. Um, did, you, did you notice whether they got them today? Did you, when you came back? I don't know because there's more there. I know. There was one. <coughs> There were Which three this weekend. I know. One, one more. Oh, just one, one now. Today. Yeah. There's also. I also saw one yesterday at Washington in Connecticut. <clears throat> anyway, I mean, this is obviously a problem that's countywide. I mean, this is not just Kensington. If you drive <clears throat> around, you'll see a Target cart somewhere, or a giant cart. I mean, it's just um, a problem. We I, we talked to our town attorney via email, and she actually recommended not returning the carts just taking them and disposing of them. Because yes. when you return them, then we've done a service to Safeway. We're just returning your carts. Does Safeway sell the little, I mean, the granny carts? Like, we used to buy granny carts to take our stuff. I and know. I, you know, I thought about that. Them. Yeah. You know, they have those ones where they have to lock, the, the wheels lock, and yeah. you're in a printer. Can't you make well, that's, that's the question, and I think her thing was, you know, you wait, not wait long enough, but if they start missing a lot of carts all of a sudden, then they, they'll just put it in themselves. So we have to be careful talking back and forth and because of the, yeah, yeah the yes. Good catch. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it, sorry, Sabina Emerson, Wake Drive. It is one thing to see an occasional one here and there, but the bridge next to Kensington House seems to gather quite a lot right. on a weekly basis. And Kensington House doesn't want to take any responsibility for you know what their residents do. And that that's unfortunate because yeah. they're 
you know, they're not helping with the problem at all. Right. And a lot of times I push the carts back on their property and then they're people push them back over on basically Johnson's property or, or the park property. Right. And they end up in the creek sometimes as well. Right. And that's um, really hard on the crew to fish those oh, things yeah. out. It's just... Um, it, has anyone approached Safeway to see if they would put those, I don't know what they are, those sensors on the cart so that they cannot be removed from the property? I know that normally they don't do them in, I don't know, they normally do them in Shopping areas. malls or things you like know, that. You yeah, know, yeah, like, you know, more urban type areas or whatever. But, and this isn't a problem we ever used to have. I think it's been going on for like the past four or five years. And it's getting worse and not right. better. Yeah. So I don't know if Safeway could take some responsibility. Well, you were going to reach out to so the I, manager? I, I volunteered to talk to Safeway to, to just, just explore. I mean, that's one option. Another option would be um, to hire somebody whose job who gets kind of a bounty for returning the carts. You have to be careful I that you... <laughs> Actually, I was thinking... <laughs> and that, that was turned down. <laughs> oh, by well. Safeway. And, and I'm, not, I'm, not the only, I'm not the first one that volunteered to do that. And, and there's... There, there, I think that, um, you know, just volunteering out of the blue might not be as persuasive as, would you like to do this so we don't throw your cart out? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, and the only place, I, I spent a little while looking into this, the only place that seems to have a handle on this problem are, are California and Oregon, which have created this retail grocer cart retrieval service. And so you know, all of the major retailers are part of it. It doesn't matter if it's a Costco cart or Target or Safeway. If there's a cart, they'll come get it. We don't have that here. Um, what do they do with them, do you know? Oh, they return them. Because oh, each of the retailers okay. pays a pays they their pay own. a fee, and then their carts are returned. Part of that. And, yes. and so I think we could potentially do something like that on a mini scale where we hire Al. <laughs> 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 but but and, and just, I, 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 I spent too much time it. looking at it. You have to, ha <laughs> it can't just be anybody, because then they're going to take the cart so they get the bounty. Yeah. It has, sort of has to be a one person who promises not to do that. So, but, uh, but the point is I'm planning to talk to Safeway. Okay, so the crew's not doing it anymore? No, the crew's gonna continue to do it. The question okay. was, do we follow the advice of our town attorney right now and just start <laughs> throwing him in the back of the, you know, let um, the neighbor behind us start looking at carts piling up in the back? I don't, you know, mm -hmm. or do we literally just take them to the dump and dump them. You know, that's a decision we've not made. It's Sell them cheap to another Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps that Put could them up be, on eBay. that could be, uh, Safeway could be approached that, okay, this is what we're going to do when we pick them up, we're just And that, and Darren, them. when you talk to Safeway, you could let them know that this is what was recommended by our attorney, is that we pick them up. If you're not willing to return them, then, I mean, to go get them, and their reasoning is, well, we can't send our employees off site, what if they got hurt? You know, then we're, you know, you get into all of that stuff. So they refuse to go out and pick them up. So, you know, that leaves the town crew. And as long as we're returning them, we're just reinforcing bad behavior. Yes. So aside, that's the frustrating thing. And, and aside from the litter problem, which it is, um, it works for Safeway because these people right. walk uphill empty handed, fill up a heavy cart with their groceries, take it back downhill and then leave it. So we need to figure out how to change that. I mean, is this, is this a simple littering violation that we, we can't can spot them? And I, I don't, I have never seen somebody walking down Howard Avenue with a bunch of grocery. I mean, I don't know how they I do have, it. I, you I have, have seen have it? Seen okay. That, yeah. I mean, do they have it with the kids in it too? Mm. Or just sometimes? sometimes. I didn't okay. see that. Okay. I mean, I understand. I mean, you don't have a car. You've got to get your groceries. I get it. I understand why but you have to have, do I have taken stuff have from there and gone to the church, carts. but I return the cart. They have the granny carts, which are actually a lot easier to use. And Strohsnyder sells them. I don't know if see, maybe the town wanted to buy some, and although but I would we shouldn't have to do that, and have Kensington House residents be able to use well, them. Well, that to me is where Kensington House should be providing a checkout service of the cart. I don't think we you should know, be getting involved with that. Oh, yes. do do that. Yeah. I mean, I've lived in apartment buildings that have grocery carts. But dragging a granny cart this way pushes, you know, your 
pushing your grocery cart you is so much. Those. You can push them. Yeah. I, have, I had to push them. Okay. Those grocery carts are not easy to. Well, I've, and they're very time. loud yes. when you walk across Concord. Yes. I know. <laughs> I've walked them back from the creek, and you feel like everybody's looking at you because right. you're, it's so <laughs> you're making so much noise. Well, right, right now, between the graffiti and all the carts, that that section of town is. I know. When the the, the the the, uh, unfortunately, Sunday was a Sunday where we had that wonderful weather. They would have been out there painting, but they, um, Jason said they are scheduled to do it on Wednesday. So, and so, again, we're talking where we shouldn't be talking. So Sorry. I know that Stroh Snyder's does sell them, but does. Safeway does not sell them because I mean that, I know it's like a men, it's not that big of a distance, but the mental block across Connecticut might be. Well, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of these people are on fixed incomes, and maybe they don't want to. I mean, I don't. To us, they're, they're not expensive. I know. Yeah. I'm just saying it's you know. They don't want to use them right they now. They them. walk uphill on. Un Unencumbered well, maybe they will. and roll back <laughs> downhill. Give, let's give folks a minute for them out. Maybe we made it a little bit easier. You know, Jack. Yep. Want to add to them? He's the only one following the rules. I know, he is. Name? Uh, I, 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 I'm Jack Yaffe. Yeah, okay. I've been to Frederick Avenue. Um, for the simple thing, when they get to be a bunch of cars around the bridge, why don't you call Safeway and tell them? They won't come get they them. They won't okay. do it. They won't do it. They will not send their employees yeah. because if they got hurt, then it goes into workman's comp and all this other stuff. So I, we yeah. trust me, that's been it's increased discussed. increased the cost of carts. Um, Oh, on the bridge. Oh, I want to thank the town crew what? handed over the graffiti right away. It's, it's the did they? Yeah, somebody did. <laughs> no, no, they just whited out the well, lettering, but yeah. that just happened. I oh, I think he just put on the primer. Yeah, and then they'll. Well, they're, okay. Yeah. Any, anyway, yes. Is it covered with white? It looks much better. Trust me, if there if there were negative messages, this would have been speed tracked. But because they were doing other things, and they you know, but they would have been over. Well, right yeah. It was all <laughs> positive <laughs> stuff. Nasty messages. I'll get nasty yeah, messages. I, I, <laughs> I get to stay longer. I know, but they were working on other things that had also been postponed. So. Hi, Bridget Collins. I'm on St. Paul Street. Um, I'm meaner than the rest of you. Why don't we just send Safeway a bill? A every, bill for every, removal. Every cap, every cart you pick up is two dollars, and here's the bill. And that's something to consider. But right now, what the crew would like to do is not have to take be responsible. And if Safeway has to explain to corporate why they are paying a bill for a hundred dollars every month to the town of Kensington, or they're having to replace, <laughs> you know, yeah. twenty five carts, which would be twenty uh, two hundred and fifty, you know, twenty five hundred dollars. I think we're actually being yes. meaner by not giving them back the carts. If we don't give them back the carts, that's going to be more than any bill. Yes, we but I don't think we've done that. No, but I think it's easier just to say, hey, we, we, we picked up ten of them. Here's your bill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's and if you right. don't pay the bill, then we toss them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys? Mary, just give your name yeah, just for the. With CUP. Are you guys signed on to the county code for solid waste? Yes. So I, I would offer up. We have a code compliance officer whose sole job is to deal with illegal dumping, and I'd be more than happy to have him call over. There we go. Well, well, much yeah. better. Yeah. 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 Now, how does that work? Because nobody visually see. I mean, we don't see who they are, but I, you know, we've had issues. For example, there was a case recently with. Um, it was unfortunate, it was a compost collection service and they had a driver that they, they were you know, embarrassed about it, but the driver ended up dumping all of the compost <laughs> over a hill and it was there, you know, it was there, even though they collected it from multiple homes, it was their waste, so the company was dealt with. So if the waste is identified of where it comes from, I imagine our code compliance officer has probably dealt with this before, I don't think this is the first shopping cart case in the what? county. <laughs> no. I'd be more than happy to have Shami talk with you about solutions to help and um, also having them talk to Safeway. There's also stores in the county that have set up bollards, so you yeah. can't forget the locking thing. You just can't get the cart anywhere past the you know front door. You have to get the it pumps. into your car or whatever. Yeah. But th it's possible that they've had cases like this before, and I would just offer up that if you want, I'll put it in touch with you all and see if there's any solutions they've worked out with other stores. Okay, that'd be Thank great. You. Thank you, Mary. Sure. Matt, can you uh, yeah, reach out to Mary yeah, sure. for that? Thank you. Um, lovely, also Wheatley Street. Well, I, I would hate to see the town take the approach against Safeway um, by just discarding that um, 
their carts. It, it's a problem everywhere. Wherever there's a metro and a grocery store, people are taking the carts and they're leaving them by the metro. And it's usually the property owners in that area who have to get them back to the store. But they're at a, they're at a disadvantage too because they, they don't have a lot of control over that. Um, the idea of um, what was just mentioned um, sounds great. Um, the locking mechanism uh, sounds good. Aldi actually uh, makes you put a coin in to mm -hmm. get your basket and then you you get your coin back when you return the basket. Mm -hmm. um, so that might encourage people to grab a cart and take it back and get a quarter. <laughs> I think they charge a quarter now. Right. But um, I, I just think with all the residents in the town, if everyone said something to management there and their concern about the, the, that we could generate enough that we could get some action um, without having to just discard their, their baskets. I think that would be a, not a good. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I say leave them in the creek until Safeway runs out of cars, yeah. then they'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then that. the water will back up and it'll all go into Sharon's basement. Good plan. Do you need me to stand up and say that? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay, well, I think we've beat this to death, but I think we've got some, uh, what Mary brought up, and uh, if you want to talk to the Safeway management, and um, so we'll continue to have the crew pick it up, but uh, we're hopefully we'll find something soon. To, not an easy problem to solve. Okay. Um, so from the town manager and staff. Uh, so we'd like to formally um, put on the schedule a work session for Wednesday, January 22nd. Um, we need a time, either 6 or 7 o'clock p.m., uh, to discuss ordinance number 0-03-2019, which is the s commercial sign regulations, just kind of finalize everything. Um, probably after tonight, we'll probably talk about the LAP ad hoc committee, um, and just kind of do a final review of the Montgomery pesticide law as well. So what time? 6 or 7. We, we normally do work sessions at 6, um, okay. but... Seven, Sue Ellen is going to be here She'll be here four. to work on another issue right. um, with staff earlier in the day. So, so I'm going to be in Annapolis, and I should probably be able to get there, but it might, it might be pushing it. Will you just come in a little late, or? I mean. I will try. Okay. But you want to, can we do six? Is that? Six works for me. Okay. okay. So do six o'clock. Work sessions are open to the public. Uh, you don't get to ask questions, but if anybody has nothing to do on Wednesday, <laughs> the 22nd, please stop by. Okay. All right, thank you. Anything else, Matt, Susan? Um, I'd like to mention Montgomery Municipal Cable is reporting uh, the council meeting this evening. Uh, this kind of a dry run for, for what Council Member Bartram and I have talked about kind of recording and providing our council meetings um, on air, either on MMC TV or even live streaming. So this, just kind of figuring out how it's going to work. Um, so that's who's in the back of the room. Would it be live stream through uh, YouTube or through? Through MMC's YouTube channel. OK. So uh, we're not quite there. This is just kind this of This is direct. testing. Yes, this is for the actual channel. So. I'd like to point out that Matt brought this up an hour and 38 minutes into the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I, but I hope the sound quality is better than my little iPad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's, no it should be better. Holder. It yeah. should be better. Okay, um, so we'll move on to the uh, last item on the agenda, which, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over from, I thought we'd already had it, public appearances, <laughs> the grocery <laughs> conversation, sorry. Uh, if anybody in the audience would like to speak to anything that's not on the agenda, please uh, come forward. Okay. Nope. <laughs> oh, we were so close. Good evening, Mayor Furman, Council Members. I'm Joe Campbell. I live on Frederick Place. I uh, just have a few questions uh, for you all. And uh, one of them has to do with a, um, the uh, removal of the uh, brick pavers, or the, what I call faux brick pavers, on the crosswalk on Kensington Parkway in front of the entrance to Kensington Cabin Park. Uh, when NZI did the uh, repaving of Kensington Parkway. Those that that crosswalk, <coughs> which had the faux brick pavers, were, were removed and have not been restored. That That's a different company. Yeah. Totally different company. Nonetheless, the brick pavers. It's not NZI that I'm necessarily okay. criticizing here. I'm just wondering when and, and 
How much time do we have to wait for that to be restored? Uh, so they were done by a separate contractor. Um, we hope to get a quote this week okay. uh, for them that will be done probably, depending on weather, maybe maybe by spring. Um, they were thermoplastic, uh, I'm sorry, thermoplastic paint was put down. Um, so they are up to code. Um, the, the brick is just kind of an aesthetics thing, but they are up to code. So. I think it's more than aesthetic. I think it's a, it's a gives a more visual recognition that this is a crosswalk. In that part of Kensington Parkway, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of foot traffic there. I'm glad to hear it's going to be restored. Is that right? With Correct. It, when weather permits. Uh, and yeah, we'll get the quote hopefully this week and, and move from there. So. I'd like to uh, thank you. I'd like to reiterate my request, which I've made to the town staff as long ago as four months, about the importance of, of police presence to enforce the left turn prohibition from Kensington Parkway onto Kent Street and from Frederick Avenue onto Kent Street. Those are uh, areas that have uh, long been a problem and have great need now of, of enhanced police enforcement. Uh, this is something that uh, it left turn prohibition. Uh, the council extended those hours uh, a few years ago and uh, with assurances that, that uh, enforcement would be, uh, would, uh, would, would follow and that does not seem to be the case certainly of, of late the last three, four, five, six months. So I hope we can step up. I hope we can redeploy some of the police presence to those, to those intersections. Does the traffic committee want to address that or? Yeah, I'll, I'll, and uh, do you want to tackle it? Um, we have a request to that would you know lead to a petition that would lead to our consideration of removing those signs um, that's not even active before us yet so it's long down the road um, but I guess the question that I would ask you on that sign is because I my personal view which isn't you know the committee view yet or the council view yet is we should be considering all of the signs together, not just that one particular one at Kent and Kensington, but also the one at Wake and Frederick, um, and remove them all or remove none. Um, but for those cars that turn left off Kensington Parkway South, um, if we step up enforcement, they will continue down Kensington Parkway and do a U-turn at Calvert head back north on Kensington Parkway and then make a legal right turn. Um, either way, they're, they're going up Kent. And so I guess my question to you is, uh, how do you distinguish between a car making an illegal left versus a legal right? The question is, uh, we need enforcement at those, at those intersections. Presently, the signs do not allow left turns at certain hours of the day, in the morning and the afternoon. And until those signs are removed and, and the decision is made by the council to revoke its previous decision made a few years ago to, to extend the hours of no left turns, then, then enforcement is, uh, is needed. And, and as I say, I've, I've spoken with town staff periodically over the last <coughs> few months, and we've seen no, no improvement at all. And, and it's, a, it's a flagrant violation of, 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 this, uh, of this prohibition. Have we received any complaints from people who actually live on Kent? About the sign? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Um, and, and like I said, it's, it's a preliminary thing. Uh, it's pre preliminary in the process. There is no active, nothing actively before us. Um, uh, I'm not sure I would put too much weight in the extension of the hours because that was a, a, we extended the hours for all signs throughout the, the town do not enter signs. We basically changed our rush hour. So we didn't make an affirmative decision to extend that left turn signs hours and give any, any indication that we were going to raise it in the uh, enforcement level of, of the town. Yeah. We have seen in the past year or so a fair amount of enforcement before the town converted its, uh, its police presence and its relationship with Montgomery County Police. They were there frequently. They were doing a good job. They were cutting down on uh, on people who uh, on the violators. And uh, so I think the, the the record is pretty clear that there was enforcement at one time, and now that enforcement is just absolutely non-existent. And, and then the other thing that we 
in the traffic committee are doing and, and would bring to the council, of course, is creating a list of, of enforcement priorities in the town because we do have our own police force. We, they go where we ask them to go. And so I think it's important for us to give them guidance on what upsets us the most. You know, cut through traffic, rolling through stop signs, mm -hmm. speed, those kind of things. And um, we, with the town's input, um, will want to decide, for example, that sign, where does it fall on the list of priorities? The fact, the fact is that it has been uh, enforced in the past. Now it's not being enforced at all. And I think the, the timing of the conversion to of, of the town's relationship with Montgomery County Police is probably at the root of this. And uh, if we have to get some sort of popular demand for, for enforcement, that that's really not the best way or the most salutary way to, to enforce town restrictions and regulations. And uh, you know, if we're looking to, to identify hotspots, those two have been so identified. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Furman. Anybody else? Chris, you have to come up here, sorry. <coughs> Jack Gaffney, Frederick Avenue. Uh, <coughs> I, 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 I want to uh, agree uh, Mr. Speaker, it is important to enforce those no left turn signs. Those no left turn signs were put there after a, after a traffic study. Roger Langstorff, who was a town council member, sat on his front porch and counted cars each hour you know, for several days to see. And by the way, I believe putting those no left turn signs did decrease the amount of traffic that goes out to camp. One more thing is the stop sign at Frederick Avenue and, and, and Kent, cars coming uh, westbound on Kent many times don't even slow down. Many times I, I stop for the stop sign, get ready to go and watch the car just zip in front of me. Um, and yes, that used to be enforced. There used to be a police car that would, they would sit near that intersection to watch for left turners and would also catch the people that, that ran the stop signs. Okay, thank you. And I miss, <clears throat> miss not having the enforcement there okay. where it used to be. Thank you, Joe. Chris? Yeah. Yeah. He, he answered he my answer question. the question. Yeah, I wondered why there was a no left turn sign there to begin with. I haven't lived here that long, but that's my corner. Okay. Well, and I, like, I would like to add some clarity to that um, mm -hmm. because we, and I've said this countless times, but we used to just do things. And we might have just done them in the past because somebody sat on his porch and counted cars. <laughs> and we have a do not enter sign on St. Paul in the middle um, that you know, was just put up there. We don't know when, 30, 40 years ago. We don't have a record for what that no left turn was, sign, was trying to address other than you know, anecdotes. And there was a traffic study. By, by a guy clicking? No, no, a real one. <laughs> but, but see, we don't have any record of that. We have searched our they have, archives. They have the thing across. But we have to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, one, one of the things that I, th and, and I don't want to prejudge this petition to remove, although I will say that every time we've had, you know, aside mm -hmm. from one sign, outside, um, yeah, every time we've talked about removing rush hour restrictions, there's been a resounding opposition to it, and we haven't done it. Um, I would say the biggest fact, biggest thing about having that sign there is that it keeps the online mapping, the ways in Google Maps, from routing people that way, from saying if they're coming down Connecticut up at you know Aspen Hill and you want to get to Silver Spring, here's a route through people's neighborhood. That's to me the biggest benefit from that. What it does for other people though who live in the area. We all generally know the workarounds. And the workaround for that intersection, and I bet a lot of you have done this, is to go a little bit further north or further south, maybe pull into somebody's driveway, maybe back out and head north, or to go down to Calvert and do an, an illegal in that big open area, or 
legally to go down Calvert to Washington, left on Washington, and back north. I go to Hadley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so we all do the workarounds, and we turn an illegal left into a legal right. And so, at least from my perspective looking at that, I think, what are we accomplishing? What I understand why we don't want people to roll through stop signs. Mm -hmm. Safety. I understand why we don't want people to speed. Safety. I understand why we don't want them coming into cut through traffic during rush hour. But when there is such an easy workaround for that sign, why do we want to give somebody a $90 ticket and three points because they didn't know enough to go a little further south, head back north, and make the same traffic down the road that, that they can now? That it's just a, it's something that I think if the petition ever evolves to the point where we should consider it, I think we're going to yeah. want to ask. Jack. Jack, happy Frederick Avenue. I just, I disagree with your statement that, that these signs, many people obey the signs. These signs discourage people from doing these things. Yes, of course, there are always some people that will, that will, that will go to Mo Trumbull to work around it, but many people don't make this. Just don't do it because there's a sign that's prohibiting it. Okay. Your point that, um, that ha having it illegal keeps, keep, you know, keeps the GPS from recommending those routes, and that also decreases the traffic. It cuts through on Kent. I agree. That's why that's, yeah. I think that's an important reason to not take the signs down. Okay. I agree. Thank you, Jack. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Name and street, please. Yes, Jason Gerson, Calvert Place. <laughs> more of this, so I recognize that there are trade-offs in this. I'll say up front that I, I'm in Darren's camp on this, but and I will say that some of it is just watching countless people who are legally obeying the sign to not do the left turn during restricted hours, just simply go past that stop sign, wheel illegally on and unsafely into that big open space around Calvert. They don't do the whole go take the time to go all the way around the triangle. <laughs> They're just wheeling around. <laughs> it's a high it's a high traffic area for kids who are going to the park, or just generally there's just a lot of little kids, including my own, so there's self-interest in it. I think there's self-interest in, in all the claims we make about what we want for traffic. So I don't know, not living on Kent, I don't know, I don't know empirically like what the volume is and how much is offset by having the restricted time. I just know when you have one stop sign, that create, it's like whether it's an intended consequence or an un unintended consequence, but you have people doing that highly unsafe maneuver where they're just kind of coming around in that wide berth like between you know Elizabeth Mansfield's house and where Calvert is. That can't be a better solution to me. I don't know what the ideal is. I don't think you're gonna, there's gonna, if it's gonna make everyone happy, but I, I just don't think that that's, that that's working as, as it's currently set up, so that's my point. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? <clears throat> just, just a final word for me, Mayor Furman. Uh, you know, if, if the police presence were there, they would presumably be in a position to prevent those illegal loopy turns at. Uh, Can't at, see it. At, Can't if, see if, it. If, if they're down there in the area, they on Kensington Parkway, they would be able in the position, <laughs> presumably, to to, cur to curb that. Nonetheless, the point here is. There are regulations and restrictions in place that are being violated. You've heard from townspeople who requested town police to enforce that. And I don't see any reason why we should try to find elegant or inelegant solutions or reasons why that should not be enforced. I mean, it's a simple question. It's a simple thing that the town has done previously when the relationship was different with the, with the county police. And all we're asking for is a, is a restoration of that kind of police presence. Okay. Simple as that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. yep. New topic or same topic? Well, same topic. Okay. <laughs> Settle in there. Right? I know. <laughs> um, Go all Tom night. Man, I love on DuPont. There was also a study uh, done. Carol, somebody who lived on DuPont. Do you remember Carol? Carol Dedes. Carol, yeah, yeah. She did the study of the traffic on DuPont. And they had somebody out there with a clicker. I'm <coughs> sure it was an official person. And, of course, we have the ability to, to completely block off DuPont. 
because what we're dealing with is Connecticut Avenue and limited ways to cross the, um, the um, train track. And so there's only a couple ways over. And so everyone's trying, when Connecticut Avenue backs up, everyone's trying to find a way around. And they're cutting through small neighborhoods. I always found it very valuable to have enforcement. I remember when Lynn wrote us, I was on the council when Lynn was on for a very brief, brief period of time, thankfully. And um, there was some question that we had with the police officer as to whether or not they could not enforce for town residents and just enforce for people who are coming through. And the answer from the county police was they could not do that because it would require them to profile people as they were driving down a restricted area to determine. And that would obviously be illegal for them to profile people. And so we had numerous people who lived on their streets, sometimes getting tickets and coming in. But I think it paid off to have that kind of enforcement because it's cut through traffic with rush hour kind of occupying. And I think if those were removed entirely, you would see uh, a dramatic re-expansion of the traffic going up and down small streets. Um, so I don't envy you the difficult task of figuring out what to do, but I think it's a valuable thing to pay people to enforce those. We have people on Farragut who look at your barricade and want one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we have people in the rest of town who say, why did they get a barricade? Yeah. So. Well, because, because actually from DuPont, right, so. it's possible to come out on the Connecticut and make a right and go out Connecticut Avenue extended. But if you go to Farragut, it's actually not possible to do that. I mean, I guess in, in, to do it legally. Yeah. And it would be a much more risky thing to try and cut across. Is it possible well, even to get across to Connecticut Avenue? No, North? but I don't think DuPont it's possible. provides Nash Place that you don't have to hit a dead end and then try to back up. Yeah. So there's yeah. Nash. So Farragut, very narrow in that if you do not want your delivery truck to now have to back up. Or fire truck. Or, fire truck or you know, right. moving right. van, whatever. <laughs> and you can go university from Farragut, but you can't go right. out. It's right in, in right North. out. So yeah. I think that's what made DuPont really, really back up when that barrier was not there. Um, so it's nice to be able to have that. Yeah. But it doesn't completely solve the problem because you get people coming through and they're in a rush and they tend to be the ones that are running stop signs and behaving kind mm -hmm. of dangerously on small streets. So what it's worth. I think a lot of the priority right now is on, is it on um, the north side and the west side? Is that correct? Well, when we started the new format of, of um, policing. We um, yeah, kind of informally because uh, we decided that we would deploy them first at the um, bus stops. And the reason for that was there are a lot of people standing there and they could introduce themselves and get to know them and also because you know, it just seemed like an obvious priority to you know, encourage stopping and at the rush hour, <laughs> at the bus stops. Well, if the traffic committee could look at getting the, I don't think you've finished your priority list, is that correct? Correct. Okay. When do you all meet again? Have you set a meeting? We have not set a meeting, but it would be in probably March. March. Okay. Early March. Um, maybe we can get the priority list completed by then. That would be good. You know, I tried to quit this committee. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did. And we understand that. We appreciate what you do. Yeah, thank you for your service. I don't know. <laughs> well, see what you can do. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other item that's not on the agenda? Anybody wants to bring up? No? Okay, we'll move on to the uh, last thing. Matt? <coughs> Uh, we have an ordinance for public hearing this evening. It's ordinance number 0-04-2019. Uh, the reason why it's 2019 was introduced in the previous year. Um, it's an ordinance to amend Chapter 7, Public Health, Safety, and Conduct, Article 5, Animals. This came about after um, establishing the dog Kensington um, dog exercise run, um, where we have to formally establish regulations and codes for the park, and we decided to clean up the language. Essentially what we've done is adopted <coughs> county language 
and we'll defer to which them. includes cattle which I'm sorry <laughs> but that's the and county cattle. includes it and so. chicken yeah. and Any, chickens. all livestock yeah um, and um, there are chicken response to verbal commands <laughs> yeah. there are um, you think I'm kidding it's in there. <laughs> The uh, the town uh, kept kept the right to enforce some regulations. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is deferring to animal control within Montgomery County Police, right. um, who can better handle animal violations. Right. So. Um. Oh, um, it was sent out by postcard to the public to meet requirements of the uh, town charter. Because we did not have a journal. Normally, it would have gone in the journal, but we did not have one coming out in time. So that's why you received a nice postcard and we got to have a rousing little discussion yeah. over the listserv about everybody leashing their cattle. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Won't happen again. They kind of look like children though. That's the weird thing. <laughs> uh, is there any comments from the audience on the ordinance before? Leslie Olson, Wheatley Street. Okay, um, dog parts. So, uh, from the card, um, I couldn't get to this document, but I found it somewhere. I can't remember. I guess it was on the website or something. And um, so I'm not sure how available it was, but going to that link only got me to the cover letter, and then there wasn't anything else there. So, but on, uh, not to interrupt, um, if you go to our website, any PDF goes through a PDF reader. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to scroll to the bottom of the page and there's arrows to go to the next page. It's within the PDF reader on the website. Oh. So it's there. You just have to <coughs> physically press the arrow to get to the next page. And so, go, okay. Yeah. All right. I read it once. So I was sure. going to read it again, but <coughs> I couldn't find it. But anyway, so um, in that first section, um, it seems that um, it, uh, to me, there were a lot of confusing um, components because one, uh, you can't let your dog go to the bathroom on um, any other area that's not yours or a public park, uh, but uh, or that you don't have an interest in. So there's a vague um, area because we all have part of our yard that might have an easement on it, it depending on where we're situated, and that's our yard unless somebody wants to do something with it, the county, and then it's not our yard or, or the trees aren't ours but they're uh, the towns, so I didn't, I didn't want that to. I, it does. It's not clear to me. Yeah. So it seems like somebody could argue the point that you could not let your dog go to the bathroom, even if you cleaned up, if it's not your own yard. <coughs> and I, I think that's. I don't know if this is the county's rule, but that's unrealistic. It yeah. just opens up. Well, uh, how would you take your dog for a walk? Like that's what I thought when I was. What? It. Like if you take your dog for a, for a walk. They pee. Right. That's what they do. Yeah. And, and that's what you want them to do. Yeah. That's the whole point. Yeah. So, like, I agree. With you, though. I, I was looking at this, and I was, some of this is oddly specific, like how many bags you have to have to throw out a dog turd. And then <coughs> other parts of it are oddly general, where it's like, if a dog's barking and it's annoying, you can call the police. It's like, well, what? You know? Like, well, there, there was that. Um, the dog could be um, barking. There's also a lot of reference to. Uh, homeowner associations and in common areas and I was wondering why the town was getting involved in right. legislating within a homeowner association I'm not even sure there are any um, there is there's at least one. there is a homeowner uh, association mm -hmm. oh that's your town area? Oh. Mm -hmm. we have a company but um, so the, the the town would look into I mean I, ha I have some property in a, in a homeowner association and their rules are their own rules and their enforcements their <coughs> own um, they wouldn't expect, unless it was something broad. We won't ticket you for the county. To <laughs> jump in. Um, well, does so the county need to revisit there their own? a lot of reference well, we, we to we exempt enforcement. ourselves from the regulations. We allow the HOA to make the decision. Yeah. Um, within it, so we would not enforce in an HOA private common area private property between the HOA. Right. So, so that doesn't apply then. Correct. Okay. Okay. So um, and then a big thing about the public property. Um, is that the easement, that whole concept of just property that you're going to walk by <coughs> that belongs to somebody else. Um, 
another question that I can't remember what the section was, but I wrote down section 1A, why was it rewritten? Because I guess it did focus on um, HOAs and commons. Um, there doesn't seem to be a definition for service dog. Um, they don't need a leash, but I'm not sure whether a service dog is the same thing as an emotionally support dog or if that's clearly defined somewhere. But um, that might be a good um, idea. I know cats are now in this program, and I thought there are a lot of cats out there that there would be I don't have a cat, but um, that seemed to be unusual that cats who aren't controlled anywhere are all of a sudden going to be controlled for a leash. Section 7, um, 504, about unwanted contract. I thought um, A was oddly worded. I, I really couldn't figure out... Um, Tracking? What the, yeah, um, it just opened up um, somebody having a bad day, going after somebody for really nothing for at all. An animal doing it's what so broad. animals do, like yeah. jumping. Like dogs are going to jump. Like I don't care how well trained your dog is. Or, like, But it's also unwanted presence. I mean, it was just a little too, yeah. um, uh, Loose. too open. Very broad. It was incredibly um, broad. The dog's guilty. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I don't like the looks of that dog. Yeah, John is definitely oh, suspicious. Oh, I would have to leave this town <laughs> if this passed. Like, I couldn't <laughs> live here anymore. My Poor dog John. is so bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that was it. Um, the double bag thing, I <laughs> took that to mean all our trash cans have a liner. So if you throw a bag in, then you're double bagged. Maybe, maybe not. Um, <laughs> I don't know. But I, it was, I, I wondered why that one first section was reworded, because reading the old text, it clearly stated what your dog could and could do to clean up after your dog. Seemed a decent way to state it. Now this is not really a very friendly way yeah. to state it, but Maybe from somebody who wants to throw away carts, it seemed appropriate. Right. Yeah. Grocery carts. So I, I, the flavor isn't really. <laughs> I think it's kind of um, brusque. Yeah, I thought it was really uh, harsh. I totally agree. But yeah, do, I mean, do we it, have a definition. It should be guidance, so, but it's I mean, not. Uh, we Sorry. are adopting county language in the, because they will. Um, so the county, and I, I should this have is, looked this up, I'm yeah. sorry, but like, does county have a definition of dangerous animal? Like, there's a, yes. There's a so there's an Animal Matters Board that defines what a dangerous animal is. So what we were trying to do is stay out of it and allow the county to handle it. It's the entire kind of point of the ordinance um, yeah. is for the town not to get involved in animal um, issues. Uh, we've had issues enforcing in the past. Um, we are not really handled to determine whether an animal is dangerous or not. Um, but there's the rule of thumb, like the two bite rule. Like that's a yeah. pretty standard tort rule. Like if a dog bites somebody twice, that's a dangerous animal. Like I don't think it needs to be that complicated. I don't know. I hate this. I hate this so much. So yeah. <laughs> like I really, I think this needs to be, I mean, besides the spraying and neutering of dogs, which was on what, page five and like some other stuff. I just, this was so broad. It makes everyone feel so uncomfortable. Oh, nice. <laughs> it does. Anyway, I understand the guidelines for the dog park, but I thought the other part um, really needs <laughs> page six attention. Okay, thank you. Okay, I again, Sarah uh, Dupont Avenue. Um, I thought the uh, dog park section looks fine. I wasn't really sure about the having to be spayed and neutered. Is that standard for all county parks as well, having a spade and neuter? It's pretty much so on the, probably. yeah, because of the aggressiveness of dogs that have um, not been okay. neutered. <laughs> and my dog is a spade, so it, um, the question, I had some questions and some in, in skepticism about the remaining sections. Um, 
me. Num yeah. The number, it seemed to me, I, it made me feel as though, boy, we must really have a big animal problem in the town, that we're passing this big, like, cat and livestock and maybe chicken problem Great. and noise problems. But I really haven't perceived any, yeah. really, I haven't perceived a problem. Um, and which doesn't mean there might not have been some incidences. My dog would definitely fall in the, you know, unwanted exuberance kind of category. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. And, but I know that there are people at St. Paul who walk, uh, there's this elderly gentleman who walks his dog around. Mike. And that dog is never more than... Murphy. Murphy. Murphy's never more than 10, 15 feet away from him. And, and 15 I, I, feet away is too far. <laughs> but, but she is... Murphy's the best dog. Was that a joke? Yeah. 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 No. Was that a joke? No. Well, you're, you're out of turn no, and you didn't ask this. No, 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 no back and forth between the... the, the, the um, and, and so I would like to think that, it's some, that we would be able to have some kind of flexibility to have a kind of reasonable enforcement. Um, and I also know that the aspect on here that is... Um, when people are present, you're allowed to have your dog, you have to have your dog on leash, but if there's nobody in the park, you're allowed to have them off leash. That's what it says, the park that's X'd out section, and under animal defecation, it should be unlawful for any person to have his, his or her dog be on school grant, wait, 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 unless, when people are present, public appreciation areas when people are present, unless such a dog is on a leash. So we understood that if people aren't in the park, that you could throw the ball for the dog, and sometimes a bunch of dogs go there. And um, But then I noticed some people who do that, they'll be there during the day when people are present, and it's not enforced against them when they are present. I think it's reasonable that right. we sort of enforce what we have, and, um, and I, I'm not really sure that we, completely need to completely close it down. If we wish where we had a big problem, and, and I understand there have been some instances of a dog jumping and knocking someone down, I think that's an issue. You can have a much elderly person and they can really be kind of... I, I, I think it's very difficult. I mean, I'm a dog owner. I have a, a cute little Westie, and then I have a pit bull who's 16, who no longer is a problem because she is completely elderly and confined to the kitchen. But in her day, she was a dog that had to be on a leash because she was extremely aggressive to any dog. And I can't tell you how difficult it was to take her out for a walk when other people's dogs were off leash and wanted to come visit her yeah. because she would eat them. Yeah. And it was unfair to her that she didn't get to go out and enjoy a little yeah. bit of a walk because people didn't seem to understand that not everybody likes your little dog. That's right. I get yeah. that. So, I mean, we're not here to, I mean, if you want to take the risk of having your dog off the leash, that's, you know, go ahead. Right. Take, take, the, take the yeah. risk of the dog getting hit, the dog getting into a fight, getting the, you know, I'm just, right. that's a risk we all take, and I've taken my Westie off the leash because she's very good, but let me tell you, if she sees something she wants to chase, you know, it's a risk. Yeah. But I think this, the point is that we could now enforce it if necessary. But we're not going to go out there, I mean, we're not looking for it. Unless somebody complains, we'll act on a complaint, but right now there's nothing we can do about well, it. Well, and that's, that's, I guess that's, it's, uh, you're then up to the randomness of if someone is bothered. But I, I don't think I most think people are going to, you know. I think the dog <coughs> exercise area saying? part I was, was pretty solid, frankly. Yes. It's the other parts that made me feel like yeah. I had to put my house up for sale and leave this bag. <laughs> that was, you know. Well, I rarely take my dog off leash. Sometimes early morning, if there are dogs that I know that she knows, then she and she'll never leave a group of dogs to cross the street. Right. Because she's just so dog crazy. Mine was into bunnies. But though. I have to keep oh, an yeah, eye because if there's a dog approaching, then she will, right like, raise up. And so I have to right. kind of keep an eye on her. But, um, and maybe there's issues of enforcing if we're asking the county police to enforce. Can they not enforce something different? Can they only enforce county law? Or can they enforce something different that, that we give them and this is what we want here? So animal control will not enforce our own laws. They can enforce the county laws. Only county laws. So that's a, that's a different kind to be, of um, issue. Also, so every single one of these laws applies in the town of Kensington at Kensington Cabin Park. 
Right. Now, is it illegal to have a, then your cat can't leave your house, is what you're saying? Uh, yeah. And that's in the county that that's... Yeah, this is that, this okay. entire ordinance. And I, my cat was an indoor cat, but I didn't know that it was a law that your cat had to be an indoor cat. Just, just, I had, my neighbor had her cat, and that cat came over to my house and got in the backyard with my dog, the pit bull, and trust me, she just barely got over a six-foot fence. But, but you know, yeah. that, if my... If the pit had gotten her, not my, that's too bad. You had Which this, is fair. You know, I'm just saying, though, it's yeah. for the protection of your animal. Cat, he would go out onto the porch, there's big steps, and the neighbor had a dog, and he would drape his body <laughs> off the step, and then the dogs would just yeah. freak out. It, it's, it's very funny. But, you know, nobody's going to give you a ticket because your dog peed on the grass or the dog peed on the tree. I mean, that's just, I mean, a lot well, of this stuff is so many in here. What's, the law should reflect what's going to be done. I know. Is what I'm saying. Rather than it has to match the county, but we promise we're not going to enforce what the county. Yeah. I, I don't mean, think can you pick reason. and choose the county? Yeah, you can adopt <laughs> certain laws and everything. But, again, so we would treat this the same way we would treat, um, the pesticide law, somebody called the town, said there was an issue, we would defer to them to uh, non-emergency police, they would send it to animal control, and they would handle the situation. Um, so. Okay. Chris? Chris Cole, Kensington Parkway. Some of my questions have already been answered, like what was the origin of this, because when I looked at it, I thought, is this a solution in search of a problem? Because I wasn't aware that there were huge problems uh, and there are aspects of it and I'm sort of lending my voice to what a couple of the previous speakers uh, have already said that it seems overly harsh and prescriptive on the one hand and on the other hand there are parts of it that are unduly vague and cause problems from that standpoint and I get the reason for the regulations governing the dog park I think that's sensible since that's a new thing that's been added to the community but there, it seems, I looked at the comparison to what the pre-existing town regulation was, and it seems like in the first section, you're actually penalized <coughs> if you pick up after your dog. Right. Because it, <laughs> the, the penalty is the same. If your dog happens to poop on somebody else's property, which is bad, but it happens, uh, and you pick it up, you're going to get fined the same way under the new proposal as uh, as if you just let the dog poop and you walked away and left it there. So it seems like the way that it's worded is uh, penalizing the responsible dog owner. At least that's how I read it. Um, Unless you have two bags. I had one question about the dog I'm part. Like uh, there was something in one of the newsletters that seemed to indicate there would be more work done over there. And is that on the surface? That's on the surface. I mean, we're, we're now, the surface has got it. We're having a problem in the dog committee's meeting on Wednesday because the, um, I mean, this is not the time to be laying surfaces this time of year, and it's not helping that we've had a lot of rain, and then we have 70-degree days, and then it gets cold, and then, you know, there's just a lot of moisture right now. So actually, um, we've got somebody coming over um, later this week to look at it and give us some solutions for it. But the biggest problem, though, is that you know this is property that we didn't pay for, we don't own it, right. and we're not going to sink hundreds of thousands of dollars into it to make it um, uh, to to make uh, water retention and all that other stuff. So we got to figure out a way. But unfortunately, we don't have the right weather to dry things out right now. This is just not going our way but you know yeah I but just wondered whether it was still kind of a work in progress it is a work in progress it's, okay, it's a definitely a work in progress thank you mm -hmm. any other mm -hmm. oh <laughs> just state your name in your street yeah. um, Ruth Speed at Frederick Avenue um, this has sort of been mentioned that this came from the county but I it hasn't been mentioned up until now. It's section 7505 animal noise. I mean, I don't know who wrote this. An owner or a custodian must not allow an animal to cause noise that is loud enough and persistent enough to disturb another person's quiet enjoyment. 
and I hope the mailman doesn't use this. Yeah. I mean, it's just so vague, so subjective. Something better has got to be written. I mean, I think before they mentioned times of day, but this is ridiculous. I mean, do something with it. Okay, thank you. It makes no sense. And what is my quiet enjoyment? I have not my neighbor. <laughs> Thank you. Chevy Chase uh, lost their dog park because it wasn't yeah, the quiet. <laughs> it wasn't quiet. No, I know we so don't want our dogs to bark, but no, I know. C it, persistent dog barking, I think, is an issue. Go ahead. Uh, David Romeo, Frederick Avenue. Uh, I just have a couple of comments. Um, one is uh, Section 7 502, part uh, B. Is there a uh, uh, is there any possible amb ambiguity, or is there a, or, or what exactly is the town trash receptacle? Is there a clear understanding of what a, what a town trash receptacle is? Or well, might it be interpreted so broadly that it would include trash cans that I put at the end of my driveway to collect my personal Town Town refer, refers to me a town-owned receptacle. Yeah, so the, the public right-of-way are yeah. receptacles. Yeah, not a private receptacle that's, right. you know, my personal. Okay. So, uh, if I, so town has a clear meaning or understanding. If there's any ambiguity or uh, uh, surrounding this interpretation, uh, town might consider uh, a public traffic receptacle owned by the town. That's uh, what he's saying. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, in, in certain of the sections, there is a provision for the uh, uh, town to issue a citation or a fine, I believe. Uh, is there any possibility or a discussion of uh, issue of citation or fine for in, uh, individuals disposing of pet waste in other people's private trash yeah. or something? <laughs> so we, we were asked that question. Um, we have not discussed it or brought it up. Um, it's not something that we've addressed with the town attorney. Um, and it's not addressed in this ordinance. I, I would think that would be between the owner of the so trash private can private property and, issues. Yeah. Um, okay. So, which typically we stay out of. So. I'm sorry, I didn't I, I would think it would just that. be everyday littering, wouldn't yeah. it? If I take my property and leave it on your property, isn't that just littering? Don't we? Is that, it's got to be covered somewhere else. Uh, but it's well, just I, not. I did address it uh, one to one. Yeah. <laughs> it's something people shouldn't do. Yeah. I um, yeah. the street. Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, on, on page seven. Um, Bobby is fade and neuter, but is that a typo there? Yeah. With, uh, Sprint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, overall, I think these uh, the ordinance is, is reasonable, and I'm in favor of its adoption by, by the council, and the adoption doesn't include reasonable enforcement. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Romeo. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in the audience? Okay. This is the hearing for them. Thank you, Mayor Furman. I'm mm -hmm. Joe Campbell, Frederick Place. Uh, I, I do commend the uh, writers of the ordinance for including the section on unwanted contact. I think it's a, it's a, an important addition. Um, my little dog, uh, Gemma, has been attacked on uh, more than one occasion in town, in the town. Uh, uh, Town limits within town limits, and uh, by much larger dogs. And uh, I think that this kind of measure is is certainly appropriate, and, and um, I'm glad to see it included. Uh, I am a little concerned about the uh, vagueness, however, of the uh, enforcement provision, 
which is um, described in section 7-504B that this section may be enforced by Montgomery County Police. Again, that seems vague, tentative, and unclear. It's a, a problem that, that uh, runs through other portions of the document, uh, particularly on um, section 7-503, subsection E. This section may be enforced by the Montgomery County Police. Again, this, this is the section that deals with presumably roaming cats and other, other uh, livestock uh, in, in town. And not to make fun of that, I do think that there's, there's need to control this uh, problem of, of cats at large and uh, uh, for good environmental reasons. And, uh, but again, the, uh, the vagueness of the um, enforcement provision is, is, is very problematic. We've seen on other occasions, in fact, it's been discussed in a couple of times tonight on other matters, just how um, vague and unenforceable some of these well-intentioned ordinances are. And I think that's unfortunate. Uh, the animal noise uh, su uh, section 7-505A uh, again is, is fairly vague. Is it, you know, it's supposed to be loud enough and persistent enough. Uh, you might want to replace the and there with or, but nonetheless, it, again, it's uh, vaguely enforced by Montgomery County Police. I guess this is um, an ordinance, a proposed ordinance that's, you know, an improvement in some respects, but the vagueness is really debilitating, I think, especially on the um, uh, section 7-502A, the uh, no number two outside your property restriction. I think that's, that's risable, and I think that we should uh, perhaps revisit that, that, uh, that portion of the proposed ordinance. And finally, um, I was curious to know how the, how the town uh, may want to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the dog exercise area. I mean, is, is there any is there any measure in uh, in place to do that uh, to, to uh, measure how well this is working out for for the town and the townspeople? I don't think it's been open long enough. It opened in um, late November or mid November, and it's just. Has well, I, I wonder if there, if the town has plans to evaluate or to see how this is going, what those evaluation metrics might be. Uh, we hadn't planned on it. It's kind of a more of an informal type of uh, dog park. Because um, <laughs> I, I think you mentioned that, that uh, a, uh, a similar dog park, dog exercise area in a, in a nearby town had to close down for some reason. Well, they did because of noise. So while This particular location, issue. you don't have that issue. So these are issues that do come up and ought to be uh, but but noise radar. is not an issue in this. Well, I'm not saying noise is, but I'm just saying Industrial overall evaluation area. and monitoring of the effect of this is not a bad idea. But I'll bring it up with the dog park committee And uh, putting in place some metrics to, to do the evaluation in a proper way sounds like a logical and reasonable way of doing it. It's a good practice, after all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor Furman. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Um, comments from the council? Bridget, would you like to start? <laughs> Um, no, I, I like I want to gut this and rewrite it, and then probably just burn it. So. <laughs> well, that's extremely helpful. I'm sorry. I don't. I, it feels personal, Tracy. I feels just, personal. trust me. I mean, uh. <laughs> that's what you get from inviting her to your house. That's right. <laughs> you met John once, mm -hmm. okay? He's he's trying. So we are, Darren. I'm imagining we're going to leave the record open for a certain period of time. I think so, yes. And then vote on this at a future meeting. Correct. Mm -hmm. So for everybody who, out there who thought that the language was vague or problematic or whatever your adjective was, um, please propose better language. Mm -hmm. Bridget, too. Because Happy to. Th this is drafted at the county level. You know, I'm not saying they did a great job, but... Um, you know, it, it, it's the starting point. And so the whole point of the public hearing and the prolonged consideration is to hear from people, but I think you have a better chance of having your <coughs> comments be reflected in the final document if your comments are more helpful <coughs> and specific. Um, the primary impetus for this change was the opening of the dog exercise area. If you think about the level of effort we have to go through to amend our ordinance, 
notice, public hearing, advertising, all those things. Um, it's not something that you undertake lightly or for small things. When we're adding the dog exercise area, I think it makes sense to revisit some of the other provisions. Um, but this is truly broader in scope than just the dog run. I, and this is something we could, of course this work session is getting longer and longer, but it's something when we have Sue Ellen here, we can talk to her about yeah. that. I think that we, <laughs> at the beginning of this meeting tonight, Somebody proposed uh, our opting into a system that would allow us to call the county, the police, for putting down weed and feed on our lawn. So we have to say, do we want to give people a mechanism for calling the police on our dogs? Or better, and also yeah. flip side of that, do we want to have a mechanism ourselves if somebody's dog is barking persistently through the whole night. Because that happens in my neighborhood, I'm sure it happens in yours, and I don't think you want the police saying, well, we have to bring a meter out there to register the volume, and then we have to sit there with a the stopwatch and measure the persistence of it. Because they're not gonna do it, and that dog is gonna keep barking. When we have language that it's, I get that it's a little imprecise. It at least gives the tool to the police officer to go knock on the door and say, there's been a complaint, your dog is barking, wouldn't you like to bring it inside? I live my life according to the motto, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I guess another way of putting it is good enough for government work. But we, we don't want to have our dogs pooping on somebody else's yard. Now. This is a varied town where sometimes your actual property goes all the way to the curb. Sometimes it goes to the middle of the street. Sometimes, usually, it goes to about seven feet from the curb. And that's considered public property. And if my dog poops there, I'm going to clean it up. <coughs> and I don't let my dog go deep into somebody's yard, deep up to their house, in order to do their business. I keep it. So we all have to assume some good faith and realize the language is going to be imprecise, but without it, we have no enforcement. And with overly precise language, we have no enforcement. We have county code that talks about nuisance. We have county code that talks about trespass. We do indeed have a mechanism to address these things without attacking people or making something overly prescriptive. I reject that. No. Okay. Well, you're one vote and I'm one vote. That's true. We're going to cancel each other out. I just think, no, oh, whatever. Derek, or uh, Dwayne. Well, I just want to say right up front, I, I love dogs and, um, and I love kids, but I have some real concern about, when I read through this, about allowing an 11-year-old to show up at a dog park with potentially two large dogs and to be able to control those dogs in a, in a public setting. And I, I'd like to really think about, have us think about whether or not an 11-year-old is old enough to show up without an adult present and put everyone else in harm's way because they probably can't control two dogs. So that was one of my concerns. And then I also had a concern about um, how are we to enforce code if someone is allowed to claim that they can control their animal through verbal commands when really when a dog is in an open and public setting or in a park they ought to be on a leash if there's one other person in that park and I know earlier we mentioned this older fellow who walks around the park without with his dog off the leash all the time and that we think you know a lot of people thought that was okay but there are also people in the world who are deathly afraid of dogs. I mean, I've experienced my whole life walking my own dogs. And it's not okay, in my opinion, to let anyone have their dog off a leash, whether they think they can control that dog verbally or not, in a public setting and putting other people who are afraid of dogs or 
other people in general in harm's way. I, I think I think we're doing the, the <coughs> public a disservice if we don't if we don't enforce the rule as it's written. So you support the language as drafted on page three. Um, Well, I, I just, I don't like the verbal or nonverbal. But that's direction. any other animal other than a dog. Dogs he is dog. He's required to be on a leash at all times, with the exception of the dog exercise area. I have a... We're so changing this to require, because previously what's crossed out is under immediate control of the responsible person. So we're going to all leashes for dogs, whereas in St. Paul Park it was, they didn't need to be on a leash when no one else was present. Right. That's gone. As drafted... Mm -hmm. Dogs have to be leashed out in public except in these uh, exercise areas. So is the goal of this to address the dog run, or, is, or are we going for broader? Because my inclination is to not spend any time on some of this other stuff and to focus my time on the stuff that's relevant to the dog run. So, so we have to establish the dog run within the ordinance right. to give us the ability to enforce it. Right, and I think um, everybody was pretty much behind. We are having issues when we do have animal complaints. We cannot enforce it. Um, if you saw our initial um, regulations within parks, we, yeah. we have no idea how to begin to enforce that. Um, we haven't figured out how to enforce that as long as I've been here. Okay, so we so don't, because nobody can figure it out. Okay, so what what were those complaints? What are the ones that we see all the time? The dogs main, not on leash. Dogs, dogs on not on the leash. Okay. Dogs in St. Paul Park for the most part when another individual or person or animal is present. Okay. Um, that's our, lar our biggest complaint. Okay. Dogs off the leash, uh, dogs defecating in the public and not picking it up. Um, on private property as well. Um, that's for the most part. Yeah. Okay. We don't get too much noise ordinance. I think people do tend to call animal control or Montgomery County Police on that. Right. But we still reference it in here, say, you know, please contact Montgomery County Police Animal. Like control not the, the barking thing I could get, you know, it's 4 a.m. and the dog is not stopping and it's outdoors, no one's bringing the dog in. Like, yeah. valid concern, but like, you know, middle of the day, dog's barking because the mailman's coming up and he's going to walk up the whole neighborhood and the dogs are going to bark the whole time the mailman's in the neighborhood. Like, yeah, again, this law applies to literally 85% of Montgomery County because the municipalities make up 15%. Yeah. So, um, but we're in an incorporated town. Yeah. I, I guess the issue that staff is having is we can't enforce regulations pertaining to animals because most of them happen during off hours and on the weekends. We have 24 hour. No. Yeah, no. Staff hours. Text Matt. Oh, yeah. you're not here. Yes. But <laughs> yeah. the, hmm. Monk, that's why we are adopting county regulations. Montgomery County Police can't do it we're, because we right. Because if there's an we're issue with an animal in the town, you can defer to animal control, and their regulations will apply in the town, and they can handle the situation, which they do throughout the entire county, every day, 24 hours a day. So why can't we put this within the purview of enforcement that we have? Why can't we have something? Where we need something similar. I mean, they, they're not going to, they're not going to, it's like Montgomery County Police will not come in and regulate. But what about our police? Like, why don't we have a way to just kind of. Because they're not on call. Yeah, they're 20, 20 hours a week right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, they're only. But we have 20, 20. I know, but who do you, what are we going to give everybody total, the police total. number for our no, three police officers total. who are at work at their other job, How at their real job? Is this to you, Tracy. Well, I know. I'm just saying I, it's not realistic to say that the officers that we've hired for traffic can deal with the dog issues well, on a 24 7 to, basis. To That's just not realistic. Here to make everyone happy. I get it. Well, my biggest concern is, is enforcement. How much staff time to include code enforcement do we want to dedicate to these issues? And so if we say, yep, that's a priority, we want to do that, and then we draft it so that we are going to do the enforcement of it. Mm -hmm. But if the reality is that we're having all these issues after hours or when code enforcement isn't available, like weekends, and then we want to rely on the county for enforcement, well, how far could we modify this and the county would still be willing to enforce it? If their point is, hey, if you change from our words, we're not, it's your own problem now, mm -hmm. then why go through this exercise at all? The perfect example is that is the, the town council a number of years ago changed the parking piece, uh, a fine from $60 to $45. Montgomery County Police will not enforce that. Montgomery County Courts will not accept it. They return the citation to the town. 
they will not enforce regulations they don't understand, and they won't enforce regulations that aren't on their books. But we um, are talking about golden retrievers, yeah. right? I mean, this is Who not can actually be vicious. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I would I mean, like to hear. I, I maybe have more no. comments. I, I would like to hear from the rest of the public mm -hmm. during the record being open, and we'll make revisions or pass them. And come back in February. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So we uh, officially will hold the record open until what, one week prior to. Would you? We need to make a recommending uh, uh, <clears throat> Friday, February seventh at four p.m. Okay. Does somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to keep the record on ordinance number 0 04 2019 open until, I'm sorry, what was 4 p.m. 4 p.m. Friday, Fr February 7th. February 7th. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. All right, is there anything else uh, that needs to be discussed? I don't think so. If we can get a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you.